enjoy it. Sweet. An unusual spot for the usually forlorn faithful. A win against the Angels will be a giant step toward postseason heaven. The settings change, but not the stakes. Come up short in the fall, and there's a long winter ahead. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh, no. Oh, no. Boston's business trip west was a sweeping success. Their aces were at their best. Their bats active and alive, and the Sox sitting pretty in this best of five. But for a read on the Angels' future, it's best to look back when coming back was the status quo in their quest for the title. The leaves turning in Boston. So can this series. The Angels better open up a page from the recent past, but the Sox will move a step closer to leaving their long history of heartbreak behind. And Turns to Fenway Park, a picture perfect early October afternoon. And the Red Sox have come to complete their business against the Anaheim Angels. They won the first two games out west, and as best of five ALDS, can they put the clamps once and for all into the AL West champion, Anaheim Angels? Hello once again, everybody. I'm Chris Berman. So glad you'll be with us. I mean, you just look at her, you feel the energy in this park, and it's just just a great setting no matter what team you root for. And speaking of rooting, the Boston Red Sox fans are frankly in a quandary. They're not happy unless they're miserable. They're not pleased unless they fret. The Red Sox actually have a chance to sweep a series. They've only done it once in their history. That was 1975 when they swept out of the AL Championship Series the three-time defending world champion Oakland A's. So they're not sure, but let me give you something Red Sox fans to be nervous about. Anaheim has the best road record in the American League with 47 wins. <sighs> now that's better. Tony Gwynn, the, the eight-time batting champion, is with us again. And Tony, I tell you, it's hard to get much better than the Boston Bats. Winning the two games out west, 17 runs, 23 hits. Hello. Yeah, and, and it's been great. I mean, if you're a Boston fan, offensively, they've been able to do exactly what they wanted to do. Johnny Damon swinging a bat well. The middle part of the Boston lineup has hit with some power. You see Millar going deep here. Ramirez went deep. And Jason Veritek probably had the biggest hit in game two, which was a two-run homer, which got him even. 12 of the 17 runs the Red Sox have scored, have they've scored with two outs. And so offensively, they've gotten a big hit. And when you're getting a big hit, you should continue to win. And at home, they're magical, as you might think. This uh, club built very much for Fenway Park. Well, Rick Sutcliffe, the one-time Cy Young Award winner in Sutcliffe, the headlines have been screaming out west Angels great bullpen falters but that's not really the case where they're down 0-2 is it no it's really not and Mike Sosha held a meeting after game two he said boys right now we're swimming upstream but he said momentum can change quickly one base hit one pitch and even as simple as one sacrifice bunt could have won game two for them Figgins popping up to third base and then Jose Molina bunting right back to Pedro Martinez Anaheim needs productive outs to win they could also use some production from their superstar Garrett Anderson they've been throwing fastballs right by him in this series he's hurt the Anaheim's offense but he's also physically probably hurting more himself hitter friendly Fenway Park could be just what the doctor ordered and specifically set that left field wall for that stroke of Garrett Anderson doesn't have to hit it over it maybe just off it Anaheim in our opinion perhaps and we'll talk about it has the guy with maybe the best stuff on the staff Kelvin Escobar although his record is below 500 they'll have to be electric though because this place will be can Bronson Arroyo and the Sox shut her down when early in the week but game time temperatures in the 70s although once the sun goes down uh, you know it'll be in the 60s and get into lower 60s but still a beautiful afternoon and Red Sox fans of all ages with all types of views with their hopes this afternoon our Kyle Peterson's been in the stands and 
There are many historical spots. Kyle, getting a nosebleed up there? Absolutely. What? I mean, can you get a better seat? We're on top of the Green Monster out here in left field. Boomer, it feels more like a fall down in California than a fall down in New England. But 81 straight sellouts this year, 145 overall for this Boston Red Sox ball club here at Fenway. This is sold out, obviously, again at $500. Tickets were going for on eBay. Something to think about, guys. Boston has not clinched a playoff series here at Fenway Park since 1986. The city's in a frenzy, though, guys. Front page of the Boston Herald. Go Yanks. They want to see the Yankees in the ALCS. Still some work to do, though. Yeah, I, I mean, let's not start, you know, the, the worst thing the Red Sox can do, guys, is to pencil in. Okay, so we move forward against the Angels. Now, who are we playing in the next round? And I think that Terry Francona and the Red Sox are a little smarter than that because they know what Anaheim is capable of doing. And here is Mike Socha's lineup. We told you they had 47 road wins this year. Sean Figgins at the second base. This is the lineup you saw except for the catcher in game two, their more offensive lineup. Darren Erstad is uh, hitting second. Vladimir Guerrero got his first hit, uh, drove in a couple of runs uh, uh, in game number two. You saw the Sut talk about Garrett Anderson still looking for his first hit this uh, postseason series. Troy Gloss uh, hit a home run in game number one that is still traveling down the freeway. Jeff Devannon, the young left fielder, he's in there and will fight the monster out there. Benji Molina, the game one catcher uh, behind the plate, hitting seventh. Big Dallas McPherson, outstanding minor league numbers in there for his bat uh, hitting eighth. David Eckstein, who came up in the Red Sox farm system, had a nice reunion with Johnny Pesky, the veteran Red Sox, almost the symbol of the squad they hugged at the cage beforehand. And that'll be the lineup trying to be tamed by Bronson Arroyo. 10 and 9 with an ERA of just over four. You talked about Eckstein being claimed from the Boston Red Sox organization. The Pittsburgh Pirates put this guy on waivers after the 0-2 season. He was claimed by Boston. He pitched outstanding at the minor league level last year. And in his words, you know what? He says, I started the game that Boston clinched the wild card earlier this season. He said, why not me start the game where they clinch and move on to the ALCS? Well, the view of Fenway, and boy, this was, I got here very early, I had to do some other business, tape the Swami, and just kind of get a feel for the place, and the street was very active at 11 o'clock this morning, you know, a full five hours before game time, and the defense, hey, they've been active for the most part, uh, Tony, for the Red Sox, especially Don Mattingly, like at first base, Kevin Millar. Defensively, the Red Sox have done a great job, you know, Bill Miller. The third baseman is the guy that uh, you know kind of leads the charge along with Cabrera out there. But you know for the Red Sox, if you're a Red Sox fan, defensively, offensively, pitching, bullpen, they've been the complete package the first two games in the series. We are underway at Fenway Park as Sean Figgins looks at strike one from Bronson Arroyo. Arroyo, six foot five, 190 pounder from Key West, Florida, and there's the young Figgins. Who has struggled? He's been such a spark plug uh, for this team, playing third and second base, but he has struggled thus far, most notably in the field. Back to Arroyo. Um, and he will work pretty quickly, although he's got the high leg kick in there for a strike. Arroyo became, I think, the 19th different hairdo on this team when, <laughs> on an off day, uh, well, when he had some time in Anaheim, had a Jamaican hairdresser put in the cornrow look. So he fits right in with the rest of these socks. Ball lofted to left. It's Manny Ramirez there. And Figgins is out. There is one out here for Anaheim. But back to Arroyo. Speaking of hair, I mean, everywhere you look, it's a different hairstyle guy. I mean, this is maybe they can remake the movie Shampoo 2 because between Damon and Millar's had six hairstyles himself and it's not going to do Terry Francona any good. No he says that when he saw Arroyo's uh, rose he, what did he tell us today he says made me happy that I was bald <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> now there's some of the look of Bronson Arroyo and uh, he will be looking down the bore of certainly one of the, the fine players in all of baseball and if you forgot the quality of Darren Erstad. It's Homer is already hitting in this series four for seven. I think the big key to this series though has been Sean Figgins. Tony he still hasn't scored a run yet and with Erstad getting on base seven out of the nine times he's come to home plate uh, they've wasted some big innings without their leadoff man. on. Yeah and, and the other thing is when you're facing a guy like Arroyo 
we've seen already. It's changing speeds, it's changing arm angles. You know, it's going to take him a little while to kind of figure him out, but you're right. I mean, that leadoff hitter, his job is to get on base no matter any, any way you can and, and try to create some havoc, and they haven't had that so far in this series. Slow grounder to second routine for Mark Bellhorn over to Kevin Millar, and there's two outs. So the dangerous Erstad is out, and now here's, you know, here's the man is named for Charles Bronson, okay? And I don't know that Charles ever looked like this, but... Bronson Arroyo his first full season in the bigs and there he is I mean that that that's that's why they have baseball caps well like Francona also said that, that's painful to look at it, it it can't feel that good that feels good it feels good yeah Danny command of that breaking ball Tony mentioned the different arm angles there'll also be different speeds to yep. that one pitch. Dangerous Vladimir Guerrero and inside ball one. Brian Rungi is the plate umpire today. Gary Cedarstrom is at first. The crew chief Ed Montague at second. Crew and Danley is at third. Larry Young the left field line. Jerry Meals the right field line. If this series goes five, and I should say this for all, there's a change this year in the umpire. The same crew they used to switch after two games. The same crew works four. But if there's a fifth game, there will be a different crew. There'll be a crew that's already out west, for example. Guerrero lofts it to left center. Looking up in the late October sun is Manny Ramirez. And a 1-2-3 in for Bronson Arroyo. The Angels down, the Red Sox coming up. River, the head of the Charles in a couple of weeks, the, uh, the annual crew regatta. And right now the Red Sox have been on full sail winning game one nine three winning game two in the late eve of Anaheim eight three Johnny Damon leads it off he's had two hits in each of these games Mark Bellhorn is the second baseman hitting second Manny Ramirez uh, in left field at the big three run homer in the big seven spot uh, fourth inning in game number one. David Ortiz intentionally passed a couple of times last game and Trot Nixon delivered a big base hit lost in the Boston four run ninth and Kevin Millar with a homer in the first game is hitting six Jason Veritex two run homer tied game two at three three before the Red Sox won it Orlando Cabrera is your shortstop hitting eight Billy Miller the batting champ of a year ago hitting ninth. Kelvin Escobar pitches to Johnny Damon and the Red Sox are underway. Escobar 6 1 2 10 28 year old from Venezuela has big has the eighth best ERA in the American League but a losing record for a team that won the, uh, the division guys. Now, some people might wonder why Mike Sosha would start a guy with a losing record in a game where his team could be eliminated from the postseason. Escobar has never started a postseason game but what a power pitcher he has become. Only Johan Santana, Pedro Martinez, and Kurt Schilling had more strikeouts than Escobar did this year. Mike Sosha hoping for sharper play from his Anaheim Angels. They, as Sud told you in the beginning, have not granted that to him thus far. And they really did that certainly down the stretch when they overhauled the Oakland A's and fended off the Texas Rangers to win the West. And once again, Damon aboard. I mean, ever since Washburn got out of the game, who he struggles with so much in game one, Damon has been aboard almost every time. Here's the defense for Anaheim. Yeah, you know, looking at this Angel defensive lineup, McPherson's back at third base. You get the gold glover uh, Molina behind the plate. But the key for them is uh, today, again, just like in the first two games, they're going to have to execute on the defensive end. You know, the Red Sox here, Damon has gotten on base. And don't be surprised yeah, if they don't test right away. Damon and the ball blocked by Benji Molina, but Damon not going anywhere yet. It's been aboard three out of five times both games, has scored three runs. And we talked about in game one that Benji Molina has a little bit of a, of a finger deal and Escobar not great guys at holding men on. Yeah, I expect the Red Sox to try to exploit that right off the bat. I mean, you know, you were absolutely right since Washburn has come out of the game. Damon's really been the igniter for the Red Sox and I expect him to not stay around first base long to really try to generate some get some action going by taking off maybe turn into a hit and run maybe just trying to straight steal. Now even the baseball Swami makes an appearance in the postseason. Damon had a feeling he'd be the key. He's one of them. 
slow chopper and takes a weird hop but Erstad just wants to make sure he gets the out it goes as a swinging bunt. And wait a minute it does not at all because Brian Runge at home plate that was his call yep. until the baseball gets to the bag the home plate umpire makes the call and he ruled that this ball went foul before Erstad hmm. could make contact with it, it did. and he ruled it correctly. Look at that bounce huh. Good uh, call. That was, like, that was like Michael Chang on clay court tennis. What made the call easier was the fact that he hustled out on line and had a great view of it. I mean Brian Runge his father Paul Runge <laughs> they don't get much better than those two. The other thing on that play was Erstat uh, um, fielded the ball in foul territory. I thought it was a smart play on his part by going into foul territory because, you know, that would have made the tag play easier. It wouldn't have been any um, bit for a, uh, a collision at first base. He goes into foul territory, makes the play easy to make the tag. Count is two and one to Mark Bellhorn. Twenty four of twenty eight stolen bases against Escobar this year were successful. Tony you mentioned the gold glove or Benji Molina behind home plate. Not a whole lot can you can do when you're as slow as Escobar is getting the ball to Molina. But they don't want to run themselves into outs. They want to work the pitch count on Escobar. Way ahead of that one. Ron Jackson the hitting coach for Boston saying before the game we're looking at twenty two to twenty five pitches per inning. We right. figure if we can get that over the first five, you do simple math, his pitch count will be gone. They'll get into the bullpen. On the other hand, Mike Sosha saying our game plan today is to score off their starting pitcher, Bronson Arroyo. Keeping a good eye on Damon as well as should. And that's not the numbers you like. Uh, 24 out of 28 successful base stealers. Meanwhile, Escobar is struggling here with Belhorn. Count is now full. Especially don't like those numbers when you didn't score in the top half of the right. inning. And the leadoff hitter gets on base. Very few people in the American League got less run support than Escobar did. You hate giving away bases like that in those tight games. There goes Damon on the full count. Throwing is Molina. Safe is Damon. Bellhorn gone. So if you think about it, had that ball stayed fair, it's exactly the same situation. Runner at second, one out. Yeah, but the difference, Boomer, is the pitch count. Correct. And even though it was an out by Mark Bellhorn, to me, Tony, it's a productive out because it took six pitches to get it done, and you still have a man in scoring position. Absolutely. And that's, you know, when you try to play winning baseball, that's, that's what you have to do. Bellhorn didn't make contact but Johnny Damon got a great jump and was able to steal second he finds himself in scoring position for the middle of the lineup. And you know who Manny Ramirez three run homer in game number one He's driven in five runs in this series and he driving in two in game two one with a walk one with a sack fly. But the sack fly put him up. And then they put him away in the end. We talked about being patient and working that pitch count. Ron Jackson's game plan of attack against Escobar. That doesn't hold true for Manny Ortiz, though, does it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think they're going up to the plate looking for a ball that they can drive, and if they get it, whether it's the first pitch or the tenth pitch, <laughs> now they're going to take a whack at it. Manny with 17 postseason home runs. Taking his time. I told you tight. Obviously, the numbers are skewed toward uh, the players of this era because you have three rounds. That is a number. Fourth best all time. Ripped down the line, but foul. We put that number up the other night. How about Mickey Mantle still in there at 18? You know. Playing only the World Series, admittedly, every year. And Bernie Williams with the most with 20. This ball had hair on it, boys. See Escobar trying to get in on Manny. Manny looking for it in, it looked like, and he was out just a little bit out in front of that. 
Escobar we talked about all of the strikeouts Tony he can go with the split finger fastball which he'll do a lot of times with the left handed hitter more times than not to get the strikeout with a right handed hitter he'll go to that good hard slider away. O2 pitch to Ramirez is away and a good pickup there by Benji Molina the backhand first baseman style. Yeah. Got him. You got both Molinas in trouble the first. Two yeah. Games. I, I was just going to say I mean this is a case where he makes a nice backhand comes up in a position ready to throw and you saw game two that same move right there didn't work out quite that well. One thing Damon's got to be cautious of though we saw Bellhorn get picked off in game two. Yeah. Little chopper foul. You look at you see set from where our vantage point is the Boston skyline and had helicopters and blimps hovering overhead and it, it, there's no question where the action is this afternoon. No doubt. No but, doubt. They've been, as they were with you know we said at the start of game number one they've been waiting for this moment a home playoff game ever since at three seconds after Brett Boone's home run fell into the Yankee Stadium seats. Well they had to inning, feel not. like it was coming because they, they went out and flat out earned it since August the first Terry Francona's team now including a postseason 44 and 18. Yeah 36 and 12 since a rainy night against Toronto August the 16th 36 and 12 including these two wins Ramirez shortstop out center field in left fielder over nobody gets it. Manny who gave one of those up yesterday and gave two days ago in game three gets one back just indecision all around by Anderson in center to Vannon in left and Eckstein at short and and a tough son. Yeah I mean that ball went up and everybody's looking for it. You see the bright sky it's very difficult to pick up the ball. But you got to pick it up. Yeah. I mean, somebody's got to take charge. Garrett Anderson's the center fielder, but I don't think he saw it from the beginning. Jeff Devannon tried to cut across to make a play. You know, Tony, you're exactly right. And once he didn't see it, as we talked about in the open, he does not physically have the ability to get yeah. there anymore. Those knees, he won't talk about it. He's a guy that has too much pride. He never complains. Darren Erstad says that he's the most professional person I've ever been around, but he physically right now is not close to 100%. And that should be something that everybody knows and you know, should the has got to get over somebody's got to get over x has got to get out in order to try to make a play try to help him out. David Ortiz with a hit in each of the first two games swings and misses there. And there is the definite defense put on by Terry Francona the shortstop x almost behind second base. And then the second baseman Figgins not ridiculously bonds like uh, in short right field but over some or shall I say for the older fans who watch baseball here not Ted Williams like shit put on by Lou Boudreau in the 40s. Well Figgins not nearly as deep because they're hoping Escobar if he doesn't get the strikeout will get a ground ball at Figgins. That comes a good split fingered fastball just catching the corner there of that K zone. Now you've got the 0 2 count. You've got a lot of options here for Escobar to go get that strikeout. Gets him on that. Ortiz doing some major fishing there against Escobar. Well, Tony, we saw on the top of the first, we saw Erstad fooled by the off speed pitch. We saw Vladimir way out in front. The conditions right now are perfect as far as the time of day to pitch in with these shadows. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the pitcher and the catcher both are in are in the shade, but if you go out to where the where the hitter's eyes are going to be, out in center field, it's awfully bright out there. Guys were complaining in batting practice that they just weren't able to pick up the baseball or make good contact. Yeah, so when you're looking out out that direction and trying to pick up a baseball it's going to be tough and you look at the swings Ortiz was way out in front of that split thing. Trot Nixon up Nixon did not play game one he uh, obviously has had an injury plague year coming back 
And then was scuffling in game two and Jason Veritek who hit the big home run to tie the game at 3 3. All he could talk about in the locker room at Wednesday night is how about the at bat trot Nixon have he kept battling 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 in a 4 3 game got a single to put us 5 3 in the ninth and then we busted it open so typical Veritek talking about somebody else but maybe that last at bat Wednesday night got trot going. What's up? This One of the many two out runs. He's had some big hits for them over the years and, and you know you get to this point in the playoffs you'd love for him to get hot and put slip him right in the middle of that murderer's row in there. Don't you think getting his bat back in the lineup is a lot like Troy Gloss back Absolutely. in the lineup for yeah. Anaheim? Yeah. They didn't expect either one of them to be back. Mm, just misses outside. Well, we had a lot of talk about game two. Take a look at the K zone. So Nixon looking at a one two pitch can Escobar wriggle free you know for all the runs and hits the Red Sox have had they've left a lot of guys on base it sounds stupid to say they've scored 17 runs they could have had 25 yeah but here's two more on but Escobar has a chance to get out of here yeah, Escobar's done some nice pitching here you know, good split finger to Ortiz to strike him out. Boston doing the same thing to Escobar that they did to Cologne or putting that pressure on working that pitch count early. But Escobar pulling the string nicely gets Ortiz and Nixon Boston strands to scoreless to one. What do you think the Anaheim Angels need to do to get on the board early here and try to take the Red Sox Fenway fans out of the game. Well Tony one thing is to get Garrett Anderson who's at the plate right now going and we suspect that maybe the wall doesn't have to clobber the ball maybe the wall get a scraper or something yeah. should, he, should he go that way as someone who was rather successful going to left field uh, during his career is that what he should do I think so I think he's been out in front and I, I, I still think his legs are bothering him and he's not going to talk about it but um, but not only him I, I think the Angels have kind of gotten away from the thing that got them to having the kind of success that they've had and that's being aggressive and, and in order to be aggressive you know you got to take some pitches sometimes and you see there, there there's a ball that was outside he lines it in the in the right center field and and sometimes that's what it takes just a base hit sometimes a good at bat of you know doesn't necessarily have to be a hit but look where this pitch is that pitch is and way off the tries off to do with it Tony because of like you said he's trying to get that weight off that back leg that's exactly right. because it's so painful for him that's right that all he can do is pull the baseball and he really just got lucky there that he didn't hit it into the defense because that is not going to happen. You know the majority of the time the majority of the time you take a ball like that and hit it like he hit it it's going to be an act. But he has his first hit of the postseason and now Troy Gloss who's had quite a few steps up to the plate against Bronson Arroyo Gloss three for three in game number one a homer and a two doubles. Absolute blast although in uh, in game number two, Boston held him hitless over three. And swinging through that pitch by Bronson Royal. I'll tell you what, those two swings right there by Troy Gloss tells me that he's having trouble picking up the baseball. That ball's by. You see him kind of pull off of that. And he missed that first breaking ball by, by probably two feet as the ball exactly. went past the bat. This is the time of day where you really have to try to concentrate. Uh, he doesn't like that. Remember the big strikeout that he had shot late in the game in game number two. He turns around a rungy there but this went around too much. Well one thing about it when you're the designated hitter that's all you get to do. It's the only way you get to contribute and when the bats taken out of your hands as it was in the eighth inning and Troy Glouse's at bat there. I mean he was really frustrated at that at bat and even more so now. It looked like he went around, so maybe just a strike call. I think, huh? he, I think he called. It was a call to third strike. Yeah, called. I think he checked that. He you know, and in fairness too, I mean, as tough as it is to hit Tony, it's got to be equally tough on that umpire. Yeah, no question. Ah. Jeff Devanin 
looks at strike one from Arroyo in on the grass at third is Bill Miller. We told you the story on Wednesday night that Devannon has an early Ted Williams signed baseball. But Johnny Pesky's eyes lit up when I told him that story <laughs> today. You know, such a longtime friend of Ted's uh, that uh, Jeff Devannon's grandfather grew up with Ted Williams in San Diego and they all kind of signed balls as high school kids but just in case anybody gets famous. Well his grandfather eventually to his dad to Jeff he's got a Ted Williams 16 year old Ted Williams signed ball. And down the line, but just foul. You know, and you, you mentioned Johnny Pesky, and that ball headed down towards the Pesky pole out of all of them. And there were some great ovations given to the Boston Red Sox as they came out and stood on the first base line. I think Johnny Pesky's was the loudest. It was the longest, I know that. Well, there's a reason for that. Here's the replay that. Whoop. Well, I think they've tilted that line, and we've seen the balls go bounding right. We're going to get our protractor out there <laughs> after the game and see what's up. You know why? Because Pesky was in uniform, allowed to be on the bench uh, all the, the whole season, last season with the Red Sox, and then another team complained, and all of a sudden, come game time, Johnny Pesky's not allowed to sit on the Red Sox bench anymore, which is, what's the point? I mean, I mean, a rule's a rule, but sheesh. <laughs> and so, I mean, that became a cause celebre up here the last month. And so, Pesky, the affronted Pesky, who was such a big part during batting practice and in the clubhouse before the game, now can't be in the clubhouse during it. And the appeal, yes, he did. And so, Devannon is gone. Two strikeouts here in the second for Arroyo. Nasty breaking yeah. stuff. And he's, he's changing speeds on it, too, Rick. I mean, you know, one time he'll throw it straight over the top, another time in three quarter. This is kind of a three quarter slider. Well, you could see it coming out of his hand. You could see it for a split second, and then all of a sudden the baseball got dark. Yeah. You can't pick up that rotation. There's no way to know exactly what that pitch is going to do there towards the end, and just a fun time to pitch right now. I was going to say, we could see it on DV. I wonder if the hitter could see it in the box. It really is unusual. There's no real way to get ready for a skylight. I guess the only time you. Well, you wouldn't have a four o'clock start in April either. I mean, that'd be the only other time that the sky would be exact and and no cloud cover really bright in dead center. Well, one thing Jason Veritek said before the game that made a lot of sense to me they, they played baseball at four o'clock. They've had games that were started earlier and went to this time period. But Boomer not in October. I mean things change as you get later right, in the year as we all know. Well my, my favorite and we'll, we'll talk about it after this pitch. It wasn't here but it was by a guy who the favorite October shadow story would have been Yogi Berra who played some left field in his career with the Yankees who were always in the World Series and, and Yogi commenting on the shadows out there in Yankee Stadium in October was saying boy it gets late out here early. <laughs> And you know what he meant, as usual. I, I, yeah. Swinging through is Molina. During the season, Arroyo had one 12 strikeout game. That was on the 19th of July in Seattle. That's his only double figure game. And uh, his last nine starts, he's 5 0. Oh. Boston has won all nine game so this is the type of pitching that Bronson Arroyo has supplied for the Boston Red Sox from August the 21st on. The other thing is you, you understand why Terry Francona was so adamant about Arroyo starting here in game three. Yeah his other two options were Derek Lowe. The problem with Derek Lowe is that the stolen base percentage way up against him. Anaheim's a team that can run. Bronson Arroyo is one of the toughest to run on. So all three strikeouts registered by Arroyo Anderson stranded crowd in it no score Sox first postseason game since game five of the ALCS last year against the New York Yankees and they have a chance to sweep out the Angels if they can solve Kelvin Escobar who struck out three Red Sox in the first inning and stranded a pair of swaps. Kevin Millar, I mean, it, it's a story every minute with him out there, and he he had the the he had the beard fluffed up even more than usual uh, at the batting cage. He signaled me over. He says, "I'm looking Amish, aren't I today?" And then then I looked over, and he and Mankiewicz had Millar's jersey on during the batting practice. And what Kevin said was, "Look, if I go a quality start at first six innings, then Mankiewicz comes on, gets a hold and a save. That's what we're trying to do over at first base." Never heard that uh, stat used before. 
Well, I saw him in cages taking batting practice, and, and I, I asked Rick. Rick was up here, too. I said, what? Millar's a switch hitter? When did he start hitting left handed <laughs> What's he doing? He's messing around, hitting left handed because we saw Millar on the back. But also along with that, don't forget, you know, in game two, we were talking about how well that hey, Millar was playing defense. Was that Minkiewicz in Millar's uniform? Turn around here. Well, it was Millar. today. Yeah. That's a way. So they're having a, just a great time out there. And uh, see, there it is. But that's really Minkiewicz. Yeah. You know, and they're not shaving. They're, they're keeping the goatee up, but then they're not shaving until the playoffs are over on the side. So they're going to get the more Grizzly Adams look as this goes on. And that's Chop. And one of our camera stands. And some new lumber, or at least, uh, at least a little tar there for Kevin Millard. I just like the way the Red Sox have gone about it. And, and, and Millard, Damon, uh, Damon was the quote, we're a bunch of happy idiots playing baseball. And that's really, re they love that quote. I mean, and Millard and the, the, these guys, they, it really translates into the way they play. I mean, of course, you can be happy when you're winning these yeah. games 9-3 to three and 8-3. to three. Yeah, but I think there's a little longer focus on them than this year. I mean, this yes. team is built to win a world championship. They're not going to be happy unless that happened. Terry Francona talked about the flight back when we asked him if, you know, people were in a good mood. He said, you know what, not really any more than normal. He said it was pretty much business as usual. I played cards. I lost money. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's well, they're on him, too, about his bad card playing, his bad fantasy football managing. He loves it. He, he does yeah. love it. He, he brings it. He gets on himself harder and is funnier than anything they can do or say. He's such a he's, he's a nice guy and, and he has him playing for him certainly since the middle of August. They have been lights out and here's Millar. That's on. Now Kevin Millar this year he, you know every three weeks you come to the park and you're not sure who you're looking at today. He fooled you Tony. Yeah. But I mean this is OK. This is how he started the year in the spring and then of course we went to surfer dude look with the eye black and then. The, the, the shave and then the really shave went from a 10 to a 12 on the stimp meter and then there's that look and then okay then we went semi corn row and now today we got this he called the Amish look and he's just I'm a mess what do you want from me that's always well, confused he's yeah. had more faces this year than there are on Mount Rushmore in 200 plus years of presidents in the United States and if they keep winning it'll keep changing Jason Veritek, the heart and soul of this team. Two run homer to tie game two at three before the Red Sox went on to win it. Eight to three. You know, we saw him set up Vladimir Guerrero on that at bat where they got the big strikeout with Veritek standing yeah. up and calling for the throw to first. I said, you know, how often do you do that? He says, only about two or three times a year. And I said, well, you obviously picked your spot as well as you possibly could. He just said, I, I didn't know what pitch to call. So, I mean, he just did a little bit of acting. He got his pitcher out of a jam, and they pick up a win. Mike Sosha, who ought to know about good defensive catching, uh, talking about Veritek with us in our manager meeting uh, a little before the game, very impressed with, with the whole package. You know, the throwing, the, the way he squares himself, the way he gets in position to throw, the way he leads, of course. I mean, and, and coming from Soch, that's very high yeah, praise. Yeah, you know, and because Soch was that way himself oh, as a man. player. And, and Veritek just seems like the perfect guy, the perfect catcher for this pitching staff. And Francona talking about when he talks, everybody yes. is. Mm -hmm. Two and one Escobar will keep an eye on Millar. Another thing about Sosha, we there was nobody better at blocking the plate. And Sut, he was the catcher, not your very first year, but but in your Dodger uh -huh. days, you threw oh, to him quite I, a bit. I had him block that plate a lot for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was telling him, we asked him about the biggest collisions he ever had. It was in another discussion. There goes Millar. And then we'll do it again. Uh, he said, remember when Chili Davis was young and lean, but just so solid with the San Francisco Giants? And we had one, and that was Chili hurt himself, so hurt himself. He said, I just kind of picked myself up, had the mask on, and said, now just make sure you walk into the correct dugout. Mm -hmm. And they did that, and then what he talked about another one with Jack Clark when Clark was a Cardinal. But Sosh won mm, 99 out of yeah. 100 collisions. Okay, yeah, it's, that's about right. Oh. The play was over. He slid into home. It did plays over. It's like sliding into a fire hydrant. 
And Veritek just didn't question Rungi. And strikeout, so all four outs. Strikeout thus far for Escobar. Meanwhile, Kyle Peterson, son hasn't left the outfield yet, has it? You know, guys are moving to right field, and we talked to both managers before the ball game because obviously left field plays a huge part defensively during the course of the game. They brought up right field, how important it was. Once you get packed past Pesky's pole, it goes directly out to right. So pay special attention to Vladdy Guerrero during this game. Two guys usually see day games here. The shadows don't make it all the way out to the outfield. Today they're right in his eyes. Well, about an hour, they'll be all in the shadows. Will be better. That one uh, fouled back by Orlando Cabrera. Let's bring in one other topic of discussion: sun or no sun. The outfield for the this is such a unique park, and we're not talking history. We're talking odd angles. Vladimir Guerrero just played three games here this year with the Angels. A couple interleague with the Expos. Not many. The Vanden has been around, but not a lot in left field. McPherson has never played here at third. You can have a fair ball go down the line, carry him back into play. What I'm saying is, you don't just pick that up in one day, right? Sutton, Tony, you just even if you talk about it, that could play a role in today's game. Agree? It takes time, Tony. You yeah. played the outfield. You know that these dimensions can affect the outcome of the ball game. No question. And you, you really have to be aware of that when you come in here. The first time you come in here, you know, and especially. In in Devannon's case, who's probably played left field here, mm -hmm. and in McPherson's case, who hadn't played third base here, you need to be aware of those those strange kind of bounces. Maybe if the sun's going to be in your face or not. Skied, Dallas McPherson over, makes the grab, and there's two out. Millar back to first. It's just an inexperienced by the Angels at these angles. That's my point. Well, even a play like this, you know, I mean, you look at the background, how it's coming out, and McPherson having to know where, you know, that that, that camera, uh, you know, those seats are for the camera guys that they just added for the postseason. That little well there, sometimes the guy can think he's closer to it than he is and, and not come up with a ball that would be a little tougher play than that. But Tony, I think about you. People talk about how you worked on your hitting all the time. I remember seeing you on the road too, when you would get to a new ballpark early. I mean, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, going out working on those balls that you would have to play defensively. Bill Miller works that one up the middle for a base hit. So Billy, who was hitless in the first game, had two in game two. Now with a base hit, and so two on for Johnny Damon. And Damon, as we've told you the whole series long. Despite the fact that he's a leadoff man with 94 ribbies in the leadoff spot. They're just getting it done offensively, Boomer, so much more than what the Anaheim Angels have done. They have now three more at bats already in just the first six outs thus far tonight in this series in the first two games. They had 90 more at bats, 90 at bats, and, and 16 more than what the Anaheim Angels were able to have. They're just sending more people to the plate. Damon was aboard three times in each of the games in Anaheim. Walk, stole a base, was stranded at third in the first inning. Now he has a chance to put Boston on the board. Total team effort. Absolutely. On this pitch count, getting Escobar out of this ball game. Everybody chipping in. I don't know about you guys. I like having my leadoff hitter hit in the first and the second inning. <laughs> you know, you like to turn it over. You like, you know, anytime the more at bats he gets means the more opportunities your team is getting. Well, the problem for Escobar is that he has walked the leadoff batter in both of the first two innings. He has run that pitch count up on himself. Way. Do you think this is? Because if you look at Escobar's numbers, I mean, he, he's got to be the league leader in worse offensive support. And he's been in games like this before where he feels like he has to be perfect because offensively his team hadn't been able to put runs on the board. And you get yourself, you know, into these these situations where you're falling behind in the count the hitters, you know, you're only going to ask, you're only asking for trouble. He shut out five times in his start. I mean, that's brutal. But I think that's what's one of the things that's most impressive about Escobar Tony is that his stuff yeah. does not slip. No. I mean he he can go out there and throw 130 pitches for you and still throw in the mid 90s velocity wise. For example last five starts Escobar two and three. 41 K's 11 walks 3.2 RERA two and two and three. Two and three. Right, as he it was with Toronto a lot, there would always be a batter or two or a situation where they thought he lost concentration. Mike Sosa saying he didn't really see that there this year. 
It's hard to lose concentration when a hitter as tough as Johnny Damon is up with two runners on. Damon, but snared by McPherson. He was on the ball, but again, the Red Sox lead two on. Scoreless. Bell, quitting time. And they'll quit here in the Red Sox and the Angels. The great Boston rush hour traffic. If some everybody having the game on the radio or maybe that rare car that's hooked up for cable TV. Wouldn't advise you except if you're at a red light to tune in on TV if you're in a car. But hey, stranger things have happened. Again, Roy will be able to take a lot off that breaking ball and still throw it for a strike. Young Dallas McPherson, who was one for four starting the second game, came in late in the first game and went 0 for 3. We told you his story. Uh, minor league uh, player extraordinaire, the Sporting News Minor League Player of the Year, combined uh, in double A and triple A with Arkansas and Salt Lake before being called up for the last 16 games of the year. 40 homers, 126 RBIs, 317 in the minors. Big bat. Big bat, but there's a big scouting report that's already out on him. He's going to see a lot of off-speed stuff until he proves Tony that he can stay back yep. and do some damage with it. He might get a single as he did the other night on that changeup from Pedro, but he's not going to hit that off-speed pitch out of the park right now. I mean, he's just cheating on that fastball. And it took forever to appeal, but yes, he did go around. So another strikeout, four in a row for Bronson Arroyo. Looking fastball. Watch how quick he starts to swing. Right there, he thinks it's a fastball. He takes off. And there it is. He's, look at look how quick he is, Tony. He's yep. flying. Oh, I mean, that, you can see where the power is at right now. But there's also a scouting report out on the young slugger. And that comes with time. It comes with at bats. You know, the more at bats he gets, the calmer he's going to be. Right now, he's a little amped up, getting some abs in the playoffs. And, that's kind of normal. It takes a little while for you to kind of get your feet on solid ground. In there for a strike to the shortstop David Eckstein. One for four and one for three in the first two games. Hit well to right. But little Eckstein is not going to hit it over the head of Trot Nixon. He was on the ball. But very quickly, two up and two down. Providing aerial coverage for today's broadcast is America West Airship Liberty, captained by Scott Daniger and Corky Belanger Jr. Liberty is the airship of America West Mortgage Company, the official mortgage company of Major League Baseball. So we thank those gentlemen who's on a picture. Coming up, bottom of the third, the Angels and the Red Sox. Game three of this American League Div uh, Division Series. Chris Berman, Rick Sutcliffe, Tony Gwynn, Kyle Peterson with you. Glad you're enjoying October baseball once again here on ESPN. Brought it to you ever since 1996, the majority of this division round, and we are thrilled to do it. And thrilled to be in settings like this. Bellhorn Ramirez Ortiz, 2 3 4 against Kelvin Escobar, who is quickly ahead of Mark Bellhorn 0 and 2 he struck him out in the first as nice as these settings are I'm not sure that the hitters coming to home plate oh, no. right now are, right. are as happy about it with that bright sunshine the shadows and then this power pitcher on the mound in Kelvin Escobar more of it's probably having to face Escobar because you know, he's been able to locate his fastball really good today. How about his composure, too, Tony? I mean, he's never pitched in the postseason before. Big crowd, big stage, yep. some big innings, and he's made bigger pitches. Well, he's had first and third with, with one out and got out of it. And two strikeouts after you know, Ramirez hit that ball in the short left center field that really somebody should have caught, and it didn't. They didn't. And, you know, he, right away he's in a jam in his first inning of his first start, and he still was able to you know, get two strikeouts, and he's pitched very well. And Bellhorn, who strikes out with the best of them, setting a, a new Red Sox record this year at 177 strikeouts. The old Mark Butch Hobson back in 85. And here's a guy we're going to talk about a little later, Papa Jack, the batting coach for his second year with the Red Sox and Ron Jackson, who, hey, he's obviously got great talent to work with, but you can't argue with the job that he has done. 
uh, 1900 runs they've scored in two years. Hello. <laughs> right? 1900 runs. Wow. Plus, he's upbeat. He goes right along with him. I mean, he, he tries to keep him uh, concentrating, not so much tell him all the different styles to hit, but just to concentrate and be themselves and stay in a rhythm. And Bellhorn down 0 2 works a walk by the way he's preached patience today guys you know what I love about it too I mean you, sure you got Manny Ramirez there but you know you've got a lot of other people too that nobody else wanted Tony. Yeah. I yeah. mean Kevin Millar has bounced around Bellhorn uh, you look at Bill Miller he's been hurt uh, you know uh, 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 David Ortiz was, was put on waivers by Minnesota he has got these guys it, it's not just a, a one man offense I mean they have a great team approach collectively yeah, don't they? and they all work together which is really you, you really see it when you watch guys work uh, in the batting cages. They all have a game plan. They know what they want to do and how they want to do it. And it's just a matter of carrying over what they work on in BP to, to take it right into the game. We talked about how they want to work the count, make Escobar throw a lot of pitches. You know, it, when you get a pitch that you can handle, go ahead, take a whack at it. But if it's not what, you, what you're looking for, go ahead and take it. And already here, we're in the bottom of the third inning. They've done a great job already of uh, getting Escobar's pitch count up. This is with Ramirez. So now, after two strikes to Bellhorn, six straight balls. Manny with a hitter's count, although with him, I think Eddie counts a hitter's yeah. count. 54 pitches already, huh? Nice. Look at all the balls. That's the patience that Ron Jackson talked to them about before the game. to center field Garrett Anderson looking up fighting the sun makes the catch going a long way but Anderson tracked it down Bellhorn back to first one out you know, right there is the difference in a guy that you know throws 88 as opposed to a guy that throws in the 90s you take a look at the K zone there's a split fingered fastball now he tried to get him to chase the slider see the movement away and then right there there's a nice little velocity on that little cut fastball just didn't quite have the tilt to it that Manny Ramirez was looking for but when you've got the velocity that that Escobar has Tony you got to cheat on that fastball to get to it yep. and when you do sometimes you get yourself out yeah, that's exactly right the velocity is, is the key component really when you when you throw hard most even the good hitters sometimes have to start early in order to handle the fastball. <laughs> Boomer, I heard a guy talking about what's the difference in, you know, you know, 88 and 95. Well, just get in your car and get a ticket. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend anybody doing that, but you know what? There, there is a difference there. And I think once you're 16 miles an hour over a uh, mile an hour over whatever speed limit it is, you're in trouble. Yeah. So, of course, I wouldn't know that. David Ortiz, a strikeout victim of Escobar's in the first inning. Yeah, plus if you're Nolan Ryan, difference between the Nolan Ryan or Randy Johnson up to 100, that they're driving on the autobahn. Yeah. Tony, he's just not picking up the rotation on anything yet, is he? No, I don't think so. I think they're still struggling. That's a nice play by Benji Molina on about a 57 footer by Escobar. You know, I know he's won a couple of gold gloves, but I, watching him and his brother, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, they just get lucky. I mean, that's just flat catching it. That, you know, you see Veritek. He gets in front of those balls. He just absolutely smothers them. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, they're, they're very. Mike Sosha did not block baseballs the way these guys do it. But you know, right now, that's what they're having success with. Cost them in game two, though. One one to Ortiz. Now a hitter's count to Big David with 41 home runs during the year. Tony, you ever just go up there and just take until you start seeing the baseball? I mean, could that no, be you what he's doing you, here? No, you can't do that. I mean, okay. you know, basically what you're you're trying to do is, is get a ball in the center of the plate, whether it's a split finger or a fastball, and hopefully time it well enough where you can hit it hard. But when you get when you got this kind of uh, backdrop. All you can do is hope that the sun, the shadows move quickly and you can get to where you can see the ball again. Ortiz swinging through that and it's two and two. I guess the last place the shadow is going to leave is center field, which right. is the eyesight of the batter. The fielders pretty soon, guys, are, are going to have the sun out of their eyes. Right. And sooner or later, you know, what, what hitters are doing, and they, they're not, they're not going to want to admit it, but what they're doing is they're trying to work the camp 
to where they can figure what they're going to get the hit and they're taking a whack at it whether they're right or wrong sometimes again there's that look like a split finger or tease out in front again you're trying to work the count so that the sun goes down that that I mean you're trying to work the sundial aren't trying you? to work you're trying to work the count where you can determine what pitch you're going to get and at the same time the more pitches you see the longer it's going to you know the more chance you're going to give for that shadow to move out of there to where uh, you can go up there and actually see the baseball and take a good swing you not only got difficult conditions but Escobar has always had success against Ortiz so that just kind of compounds Absolutely. the problem for Boston. And that's why when that count was two and one you could pretty much figure hey I'm going to get something pretty good to hit here I'm going to take a whack at it. He takes a whack at this one sends it toward the monster. It's high up off the wall. Double for Ortiz, runners at second and third. And that wakes the crowd up. They're kind of sitting on their hands here. They're ready to use them. To me, that's, that cures a lot of bad things. You stand back and hitting the ball the other way. You see, this ball's in down in the middle of the plate, and he doesn't try to pull it. He goes with it. He uses that green monster. But to me, Tony, that should have been a single. There was a conversation between Garrett Anderson and Devannon after that play because he hesitated. He came up looking to make the throw to begin with to third base. You have to know, see him right at the last second, pull the ball back because that's when he heard Garrett Anderson hollering second. You should be able to hold Ortiz to a single on that and keep the double play in order. Side Molina good play to track Nixon ball one Red Sox granted two in the first two in the second that means thus far in two games plus 23 left on base. Oh by the way they've scored 17 runs Can they play two here. Another bouncer. Now this is the way they teach it even at the little league level as far as keeping the ball in front of you watch the glove turn over look at the body look at the upper body in particular how he tilts towards the ground so that if it comes up and hits in the chest it has nowhere to go but straight in front of it. Absolutely right. Infield in this early. But it's not just any game they're down 0 2 in games. Nixon rips it to the right side. Bellhorn scores. Up throwing is Vlad Guerrero. So with that arm and Ortiz the runner, he won't motion forward. But the Red Sox are on the board. Tony had, had to eventually get Escobar in trouble. He has now walked the leadoff hitter in all three of the first three innings. Yep. And it's good hitting by Trot Nixon. He just waited him out. Got something in the middle of the plate. Drives it in the right field. Knocks in the first run. Now uh, very quickly Buddy Black the pitching coach out there and everybody on the infield a basic football huddle on the mound. I got to give Ron Jackson a lot of credit for these last two victories because in game two with Cologne on the mound they made him throw 66 pitches in the first three innings and he needed to throw another one if Molina hadn't picked off Bellhorn yeah. at second already now they are at 64 pitches here in just the bottom of the third Ron Jackson told us before the game what the game plan was to be credit to him and to the Boston lineup for getting it done. Yeah. Kevin Millar up with runners on the corners and one run home. Two sharply hit balls by Ortiz and Nixon. That's the best swing we've seen from Nixon this year. Yeah. Away to Millar. Walked in the second inning. Hit a two run homer in game one. Three for seven. Sorry, this, Tony. This goes right into the game plan here. You know, Nixon worked to count to 2 0, got a ball in the middle of the plate, lines it in the right field. Millar. Already ahead in the count one and oh he can kind of zone in look for something that, he, that uh, he'd like to swing it. That's foul you saw Scott Shields up uh, throwing he was summoned early uh, in game one when the Red Sox knocked out Jared Washburn in a seven run fourth inning. Oh, my 
Mike Sosia hoping that there's some enough strings to pull. And running out of rope. Yeah, he is. He knows it too. Believe me. That's what Malara was talking about with Boston this year, saying, uh, "Yeah, we're a lot of loose strands going all different directions." Right. But he made a good point. When you put a lot of loose strands together, Boomer, you can come up with a pretty strong rope. A lot of loose strands, a lot of spaghetti on one plate. <laughs> one and two to Millar. Broken back. Little bleeder. Well, Millar is out, but Ortiz lumbers home, and it's two nothing Swat. That's one way to drive in a run. Yep. Not great. his usual way. Great pitch by Escobar. He just couldn't, couldn't. get turned around yeah. to make that play. If he catches it, he could have doubled up Ortiz easily at third base. But you know, they talk about baseball being a game of inches. It proved it right there. Just a little too much sauce on that spaghetti on that time, huh? Just couldn't uh, couldn't come up with it. And Sosha's trying to get Benji Molina's attention. He wants the intentional walk here to Jason Veritek. The times in game two to get to Nixon. It work. One of them did not. So now Veritek will walk. Well, he also intentionally walked Veritek. Yes. In that big ninth inning with Cabrera coming up behind him and it hurt him. Cabrera hit the double three run scored to break that game two open. Tech with real good numbers though against Escobar 4 12 and 17 at bats seven hits coming into the game today he struck out in that first inning Tony but the shadows were right behind the second base back they're almost completely out of the outfield now yeah and if you're a right handed hitter the view should be pretty good right now well, if you're a left handed hitter you might have to wait another 15 minutes but if Cabrera comes through, who knows what evil lurks? The shadow. That's going way back to Yeah. Before our time. <laughs> I only read about that. Orlando Cabrera, you said it, Suck. After the walk, ended things with uh, the three run double in the ninth in game two. I mean, he gets a base hit here. You might be talking MVP of this series. Fielded beautifully. Terrific. Particularly in game one. And then he was a big part of it with just a walk, but a run scored in that big seven run inning in game one in the fourth. One and one. 29 year old Orlando Cabrera. Fielded nervously his first maybe 10 days as a Red Sox. Hit well, started with a homer, but Theo Epstein saying what he's wanted to make a triple play on every ball that was hit to him, even with no runners on. Well, he's gotten his sea legs down here in Boston, that's for sure, after being the regular starting shortstop in the big since 99 with Montreal. Yeah, but don't you think it's a little bit different? He plays, of course. He's playing in more in front of more people right now than he did in two months up there at I home. I know, I know. And it wasn't always at home in Montreal. Sometimes he had to go to Puerto Rico to hit in the bottom of the ninth. I'm happy for him. Uh, you yep. love seeing a guy Good with guy. this kind of talent being able to do it on baseball's biggest stage. Happy, loose. Doesn't get much bigger than this. That's popped back towards us. Sut uh, left the butterfly net uh, in the room. We got a gold glove outfielder here. I want to get hey, out of the I, way. You know, him. every time a ball comes up here, I'm ready to dive under the Come table. on. You better not I'm be. telling you. Just You're our only protection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got I remember, you covered, What dude. was that all star game you had to play center? I forget where the other outfielders were. It was, it was Pittsburgh. Here? No, it was Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Well, that's, you're going to have to play center with us, okay? Right, I got you. Well, it'd be easy to confuse which All-Star game he was. Well, no, center. I remember when <laughs> we were talking about it. <laughs> Blocked nicely again, Molina. And so the count two and two with two on and two home. 
I think Sosha might have said something to him about you got to get your body down. You got to drop to the ground with those knees. You got to turn the glove over because he has been perfect the last couple of times that's, he's had to do that. That's a nice job. Right? The ball in front. And you know Sosha is a former catcher. He's you know he's told him. He's yep. told him both. You know, get your body in front of that of that ball. You got to smother that ball. Because you know the sign you're putting down. Uh -huh. If they put down split finger, they put down slider, you got to anticipate yep. that. Now, if he bounces the fastball, that's a different story. That, that should not happen. Get up the middle. But not far enough. Snared Figgins. The Red Sox have to be happy with just two. But they're on the board through three. Two nothing Red Sox. Terry Francona coming up live. We come back. The uh, bottom half of the third to lead the Angels two nothing. Top of the fourth and kind enough to join us as the uh, uh, first year manager of the Boston Red Sox, Terry Francona. And Terry, uh, you guys have been very patient at the plate. Escobar has thrown a lot of pitches. Obviously, game plan going in, isn't it? Yeah. You know what? Every pitcher we face, we, we try to more than be patient. We try to work the count and get in hitters counts because we have guys that can do stuff when they get in hitters counts. And we've done a great job so far. But you know, we need to get a couple more long innings because if you get into a bullpen fourth fifth inning no matter how good they are you got a chance to do something with them Terry it looks like in about another inning it's going to be a moot point but what are, what are your fielders and hitters coming back telling you about the eyesight out there with the glare and center it's specific you know what it, it's real tough and Escobar that was something we were really worried about because of his change of speeds and the split it's really difficult to see the ball it's going to get a little bit easier right now and hopefully we'll have a little bigger lead and it'll, you know, it'll be to our advantage because it's been tough first three innings and that gets easy to manage with a big lead good luck okay, Terry guys, thanks for you're joining very us welcome. very kind of him to do that playoff game do that yeah you know, other things on your mind than to waste time BSing with me frankly but uh, gives you a feel for what he's looking at and, and exactly the game plan that you guys have been I talking know about. exactly what he's doing he's trying to get some insight on the Swami picks coming up he did point. ask me he says you aren't doing well aren't you I said Terry Sorry. don't worry about that yet he he some of that money do. back he lost on that plane trip <laughs> And we had a great version of the Swami. The Red Sox uh, were kind enough to put a welcome for me up on the on the green monster and, and, and put the record up on the board which in October is usually horrendous but it's 14 and 8. We went inside the monster went back of the monster uh, before the game. Our producer Billy Fairweather amazingly came up with the key and uh, wow. Jimmy Pearsall's name some of the names signed back there didn't really have a chance to look at everything. But I'll sign my name back there. I know. And uh, Billy Miller grabbing that pop up by Vladimir Guerrero. You know I signed mine in there today. You had to. Hey, this is inside the monster. It's still the the hand. This is live shot. Still the the hand scoreboard. You know, hanging the numbers like they did uh, since they built this place in 1912. Open the, the week the Titanic sank. Okay, back in 1912. And here's the little view. Not a great view out of there, but well, that, the mail said it. And there's our view out there. Well, that man's been busy because they are 57 and 24 here at home. And Tony, the number one reason is that they're scoring almost six and a half runs per game. Yeah. He's not just flipping that zero. No, over. he's not. At least not for the Red Sox side. Well, that's been a key in this series too. It's been the big Absolutely. inning that Boston has been able to put up in both Game One and Two. I think Terry Farcona hit on on exactly why is because they've been patient at the plate. They've been patient. They've had a bunch of opportunities. Don't get me wrong. But they've been patient and been wait, willing to wait the count out to get something good to hit. They've had a ton of hits with two outs, scored a ton of runs with two, two or scored a ton of runs with two outs. And so when you can do that uh, and you're getting good pitching to go along with it, you're going to win ball games. Pure and simple. That's pure and simple the way they're pitching to Garrett Anderson yeah. so far. Everything has just been away and mostly been soft. A week. Looper and again is grabbed by Billy Miller and so two pop ups by Vlad Guerrero and Garrett Anderson just meekly sitting back down on the bench. How about this does, it, does a leg kick like this bother you as a hitter can it. No I don't think so I think the biggest problem right now like in Garrett's case Garrett Anderson's case is he's just having a whole lot of trouble staying back once he picks his front foot up his weight is going full and. Whether you got a big leg kick or you know, 
big or, or an arm delivery straight over the top or three quarters, it's, it's going to be difficult if you can't stay back. Well, I was a, a first strike to Gloss, and uh, it, it, Troy has been disgusted his last few at bats uh, with the, the strike. I'm going to say right or wrong. I mean, we, we detailed it in game two, and it got so. Uh, he's not disgusted with this. Absolutely belted, gone. That's what we call a two backer. Back, back, gone. His two home runs have been absolutely crushed. Well, a couple of years ago, when the NIM Angels won the World Series, he hit three home runs against the San Francisco Giants. They dearly missed his bat when he had shoulder surgery back in May. And, Tony, I got to feel like right along with his bat, I mean, they have missed his defense. He's not able to play third base, but we know when healthy, he can play it as well as anybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, look at this. That, that shattered 10 cases of Coke bottles up there. I mean, there's glass all over the place. And Manny, now what did we talk about? This is that not quite a Yaz. Again, he looked. Yeah, I don't think that's coming back. No. That's very. I mean, that was. And Don Mattingly slash Kevin Millar gobbles up another one at first. Jeff Devannon gone, but the Angels on the board. Now we're back here at Fenway. Two to one, thanks to Troy Gloss's absolute bomb. Troy duck under Gloss. The only people that were ducking were those driving home at rush hour on the Mass Pike. So a two to one game, and kind of quiet again. I just, I, I'm really kind of surprised that the whole fan atmosphere. It's just, uh, all right, okay. So they're going to win, and then what do we do? Well, not so fast. Bill Miller. Uh, to lead off the fourth and then Tony Johnny Damon the leadoff hitter batting for the third time in the game in the top of the fourth inning yeah. that's what you like to and see that's what you say. exactly you like to see that you got the lineups turned over uh, twice and, and uh, he's coming up leading off or, or coming up to the plate for the third time in the fourth inning that's a good sign if you're a Red Sox fan. Miller single and that's under the glove of Sean Figgins and a tough play but a play that he could have made guys and meanwhile, with Miller on a Damon coming up, now here's the, the discussion on the Troy Gloss situation uh, side. Well, Mike Sosha started yelling from the dugout after the first pitch because he felt like it was a ball. You look at the K zone, you're going to see just slightly off the outside corner. There was a conversation, and all of a sudden, out of respect for Brian Rungi, he comes out and talks to him. He says, Brian, you know what? We saw it on the video. That ball was a little bit outside. Brian Rungi is more so of a pitcher's umpire than what we saw in game two with Jerry Mills. But the thing about Brian, he is as consistent as they come. If he calls it a strike for one team, he will the other. And he called that pitch a strike to Johnny Damon. That's going to go as an error uh, to Sean Figgins. Not a base hit for Bill Miller. Well, Figgins is really struggling. Yeah, he is. You know that he's supposed to be on the bench with a healthy Troy Gloss and also a healthy Adam Kennedy. Damon. What a surprise. Another base hit for Damon to left field. The batter up with it quickly. But now the Red Sox in business once again. Johnny aboard two of his three times in this game. So let's see. Three, two, he's been on eight times yep. in the three games. And that's what your leadoff hitter is supposed to do. Get on base. Cause some havoc. In this case, he gets a base hit with Miller on in front of him. Kind of fights this ball off in the left field, and that's what the Angels have not been able to do is get their guy at the bottom or guy at the top, Figgins or Eckstein, been able to get those guys on base on a consistent basis. You try to drop one here? Apparently, not. I would say I would, but I mean, I, I know that's not the way they do it, but they only had 12 this be a good spot? Long. I understand that. <laughs> Johnny Damon telling me before the game that he had to see a chiropractor yesterday because of the bad migraine headaches that he was having in game one and game two. He said the headaches are gone now. Never had a migraine. Like that. I, 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 I have. I have. It's not, not fun. You shut everything down. You know, the fact that he could play it, if, if, if full migraine, he couldn't have played through. I, I, those aren't fun. One sacrifice bunt on the year for Mark Bellhorn. Well, we talked about the 12 for the team. Six of those came from Pokey Reese. 
Well, they don't need to sacrifice. They're going to get the count to three and zero. Oh. Boy, Escobar really laboring up there, close to 90 pitches. Now at three and zero, oh, the way he misses the ball a lot, do you swing him or just let him? What do you want him to do? No, no, no. You're definitely taking him because of the MVP candidate in the on-deck circle, Manny Ramirez. And a strike from Escobar. And that's why you don't bunt here. I mean, that's why Terry Francona is not bunting, I should say. You got a 374 on base percentage during the regular season for Bellhorn. I mean, he's got a lot of confidence in this guy. And he draws a base on balls. He was adept at doing that. You mentioned the on base percentage. How about this? Base is loaded, none out for Manny Ramirez. You wonder how could Escobar walk Bellhorn the last two times up. Well, Tony, he walked 88 times during the regular season. Only two guys in the American. Mark Bellhorn. You know, it's hard to believe a guy that can walk 88 times and strike out 170 times. I don't know how you explain that. I, 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 I can't. I can't explain that. I don't know how you can explain walking Bellhorn with Manny Ramirez hitting behind him most of the year. That makes no sense. Now, yeah. and this one goes all the way to the backstop, but nothing going. It's not a long way to the backstop here, and I get a decent bounce back. Now again, it's Bill Miller, not Johnny Damon, the runner at third. Great point, Boomer, because Damon was often running That's towards exactly. third base. If Damon were to have been at third, he would have scored exactly. easily. But we asked Terry Francona about specific people and who he might give the green light to. Bill Miller was not one of those guys. I mean, this guy's playing on bad knees. He's, he's had knee surgery the last couple of years and just doesn't run like he once did. I tell you what, though, the Angels just continue to shoot themselves in the foot here. Huh? An error and a, a wild pitch, it, it doesn't do a damage then. Buddy Black, one of the best in the business, pitching coach out there just to try to settle Escobar down. I mean, not that pitching with the bases loaded to Ramirez and then Ortiz is, is any is any soothing conversation, but he's got it. I mean, he's got to shut this thing down right now. Well, we've seen this before, though. We've seen Escobar get a little bit out of sorts, and I think the play not made by Figgins could have led to this. Remember, that yep. ball was catchable. Adam Kennedy makes that play. You got one out, nobody on. You don't get it. All of a sudden, Damon flips one over your shortstop's head. You walk Bellhorn. You're in trouble. He's trying to get him back to where he can focus and at least get him out here. Now they need to play near perfect baseball, and they're far from it. Now they need to make perfect pitches to this man. Gets him fishing. The other thing is, is you know, we, Rick and I, we've touched on this before. Molina's got to do a better job of trying to get his body in front of that baseball. You can't afford it. We got the bases loaded. It's a one run game now. You can't afford to be trying to backhand the ball. You got to shift your body and get in front of that thing and keep it in and knock it down and keep it in front. And you got a force play at home right now yeah. that almost got away from you because you let the ball get exactly. away. Wrapped to left center field. Devannon grabs it. Miller scoring 3 1 Boston. Not necessarily what he was trying to do, you know, going up there primarily, but. Second sack fly of the season. Yep. They all count. Yep. He's uh, sixth RBI. It's not so much that, that Escobar didn't pitch well today. It's the fact that the pitch count got to him. He has thrown 92 pitches, and he has only gotten one out here in the fourth inning. Mike Sosha has to make this move. Well, so Escobar pitches only into the fourth. He's given up the three runs. There's two on. The dangerous Ortiz is up. And we'll be back. I'm looking for a job as an auto technician. I can fix cars. It's like a work of art to me. It's almost like a person. It's like giving a car a new heart, you know? You, you put a new engine in and you know it's going to be great. I went to school for uh, diagnostics. I got my certification. You can find me on Monster.
Carter, Calvin Escobar is gone. Scott Shields, who came in to work the fourth and fifth inning in game number one, is in. The Shields uh, gave up a home run to Manny Ramirez, but then retired what followed, including David Ortiz, and then the lineup that he's going to see now. But with two on, a run home. Here's Ortiz against the right-hander Shields. They don't have a left-hander option anyway, and so they just bring the guy that's best available. You see, Shields has won eight games and, and is in exactly, theoretically, that position today if Anaheim can get some hitting going. Well, you'd love to have an Alan Embry or a Mike Myers. Most of the damage done this year by David Ortiz was against right-handed pitching, and that is all that Mike Sosha has to go to. ahead of Ortiz 0 and 2 David has, has struck out but then hit the big double off the wall and later came around to score the second run in the third inning You're Boston you'd love to get more than one run here you had the bases loaded and nobody out and Ramirez does a, a really a good job and knocks in another run but I could put a cricket number up on the board. Now he held. Good high fastball after some off speed pitches. Take a look at the side angle there. A correct call again by Kerwin Danley at third base. He's calling for a little time. Red Sox really have a chance to put the Angels on the ropes. They've left two on in each of the first three innings. And although they lead at 3-1, they really have a chance to put a hurting on a team that's down 0-2. Fisted and foul. Right, they've, they've had opportunities. Oh, got a good one here. And again, bases loaded, nobody out. You know, you're here to Angels. You're hoping you can get a ground ball, and hopefully you can turn two on. But you know, Fickens had a ball that you know, he made an error on a ball he should have come up with, and that's turned into a run here for the Red Sox. It's away. Two and two. Red Sox players never quit. The, the, the imagination to get the letters ESPN and these signs, they're, they're very impressive by the, by the fans over the years. You know, Mike Socha's players don't quit either. That's how they won it at all in 2002, and this ball is belted to right field. Long run, Vlad Guerrero. He won't get it. Damon's going to score. Here's the relay in Bellhorn being held up. Second double of the game for Ortiz, 4-1. When you talk to a lot of the Red Sox players, they flip a coin as to who their MVP has been this year. Was it Johnny Damon? Was it Manny Ramirez? Or was it David Ortiz? Tony, they talk about how consistent, though, their designated hitter has been this year. And here he had a really good at bat. Got a ball in the middle of the plate, drives it in right center field. And you can see that this is an inning where you had the bases loaded and nobody out. You wanted to try to get more than one. And, and now they have. They've knocked in two. Bellhorn at third, Ortiz at second, and track Nixon up. Infield in Anaheim. Two runs home here in the fourth, two runs home in the third, Boston. Way again to track Nixon, 2 and 0. And Kevin Millar on deck. Away 3 0. And you 
know what that's going to be. They will put him on. Yes. How about the unintentional, well, it'll, exactly. the unintentional, intentional walk at 3 and 0. You turn it around, face Millar. Take a chance and try to turn that double play mm -hmm. again. Not a bad idea here, but that is already six base on balls that the patient offense of the Boston Red Sox boomer has been able to acquire. But look, we, we said that Boston really had a chance not to put it away. I mean, we're only in the fourth inning, but look, they have a chance to sit on a team and not even let them get their sea legs exactly. at all, right? And that's what you should do. You're coming home. You got a two nothing lead. You've had opportunities here to really break this thing open and kind of take the air away from from the Angels. And, and they've got four runs on the board, but they could easily easily have you know seven or eight. Red Sox with reason to be that way. 21 runs thus far in two and a half games against the Anaheim. Well, not only do, do they look tense in the dugout for the Anaheim Angels, Tony, but they're playing tense. Yeah. I mean, they're just they're not relaxed defensively and they're not patient offensively. So now with the sack full of socks. It's Kevin Millar. Walked. Ran out of second. Well, he ain't going to move. Hit by a pitch 17 times. He does not budge on that fastball in. He's got a lot of pull in that clubhouse, and he's got a lot of pull in his at bats. And Einstein bobbles it to shovel the third safe. Another run scores. The halos are over the heads of the Red Sox with the way the Angels are playing defensively. Well, that's a double play ball right here. There's that ball come up, hit him right in the palm, right in the heel. I mean, he set a club record, that being Eckstein, for fielding percentages at the shortstop position this year. They could not, Boomer, have picked the worst time to start playing like this. Well, you couldn't even see it coming. I mean, it, it, it it's not as if this is kind of the way they were playing late in the year. It's exactly the opposite. You've got to give credit to the offense, though, of Boston, Tony. They yes, keep do. putting that pressure on. And that's what you're, if you're, that's what you should do. You keep putting pressure on the defensive team. Make them make plays. And here's X time with another chance at it. The shovel to Figgins. Over to Erstad. Veritek is doubled up, and the Angels do turn the double play, but the Red Sox hang a three spot. World Series in its first decade of business. Will there be another one here? Will they have the proverbial chance once and for all? The Red Sox with a 5 1 lead now for Bronson Arroyo. As we hit the top of the fifth, the Anaheim Angels down two games to none. Gotta get something going. Certainly defensively they do. And at the bat rack, 7-8-9, Melina McPherson Eckstein are your batters against Arroyo, pitching his first time in the postseason as a starter. Bronson pitched three games in the Yankee series last year in the ALCS. Worked in games two, five, and six. Scoreless uh, in the first two, and then gave up a homer to Posada in game number six. But this is his first start. And that has to help him. I mean, he's been there, Tony. I mean, you break the ice, you, you know what it's like, you know how to control that adrenaline. And he has tr had tremendous control of that breaking ball thus far tonight. He waves at that one, does Molina. And that's a big way to start an inning after your team gets three runs. Well, Many people in the stands here are dreaming on. One is our Kyle Peterson. Kyle? There he is. Yeah, the Aerosmith frontman, Steven Tyler. Steven, born in the Bronx, man, living in Boston. So how did you get to be the Red Sox fan? Oh, uh, just uh, by virtue of my schedule, it keeps me here. And I'm just feed feeding off the energy. You know, it's just, this is the year for Boston. I mean, you know, it's going to explode. 
Right. Now, you told me that your tour schedule is going to allow you to stay through the World Series. Well, what would it be like to see the Boston Red Sox play in the World Series? Oh, please. It'll, it'll wipe the slate clean. You know that, I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're going to let me sing for the uh, first of the World Series, so I'm there. Yeah, that was you sang last year, opening day. Uh, I mean, being a Red Sox fan, it's just to sing at the World Series for the Red Sox, first time in so long. I mean, what, what, was, what would that be like? It was sweet. Plus, I got my, my son walked me out and handed me my harmonica. It's all about that. Yeah? Yeah, it was beautiful. All right, what makes you think this is the year for the Sox? Uh, well, look what they're doing. Look at this. It's insane. It's just a good thing. So, Steven Tyler, we appreciate your time. Have fun. My pleasure. All right. Boomer. All right, Kyle, but it does speak for itself when Veritek makes a play like that. Millard drops it, but they still call my eye. I just love the coat and tie by Kyle Peterson down there with <laughs> Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. It's somehow, what's wrong with this picture? Well, what's wrong with your picture? You can't quit smiling seeing <laughs> Steven Tyler right there. And these Boston fans continue to smile. They have seen Veritek. And that's the right call. I mean, he's a, he's a free agent at the end of the year. And if there's anybody they need to bring back, it starts with their catcher. I think he'll be the first guy. I love that analysis. Well, why do you think it's here? Well, look what they're doing. It's pretty clear. Yeah, it 22 is. 22 runs. Yep. And had opportunities. Left eight guys on base so far. In four innings, the leadoff hitter's coming back up in the top of the fifth, bottom of the fifth again for the fourth time. Tell you what, Steven Tyler would say it. They're uh, playing with the Angels like toys in the attic. <laughs> you, knew, you knew that would only begin. We do have a few of those keyword in the sentence albums. Yeah. Well, everybody under about 20 thinks Aerosmith kind of came out with a hit a few years ago, you know, and no, man, they're in the early 70s here. Boston band, big in New England, they're big in our dorm. Not many people out of New England knew about them, 73, 74, but they, what have they done since? A lot of people turn out okay. Starting to get that same feeling he's got about these Red Sox. Three runs. Here's Arroyo coming up and putting on a one, two, three inning against the Angels. Heading to the bottom of the fifth, 5 1 Bob Sox. The bottom of the fifth here at uh, twilight time in Boston. Red Sox sending eight to the plate in their three run fourth. And now, Tony, you got Cabrera, Miller, and the leadoff man, Johnny Damon, coming up the fourth yep. time in the fifth inning. Boston with. Five runs home, eight left on base. <laughs> Man, 19 and 27 left on base in two and a half games. Oh, by the way, 22 runs. Think they've had chances? Yeah, well, you don't send that many people to the plate unless the opposing pitching helps you a little bit. And with six walks allowed by Anaheim in those first four innings, Tony, they, yep. they put themselves in this hole. And you can also include their defense allowing you know, guys being able to come up and, and get extra at bats, you give teams extra outs, they're gonna take advantage of it. Red Sox head. Well, they pretty much helped them defensively every inning. The ball that was not caught, that was hit by Manny Ramirez in the first, and then, you know, just ground balls, I mean, throws that have gone to the wrong base, ground balls that should have been fielded, double plays that should have been turned. You know, if it continues like this, think of, you know, there was, we were out in Anaheim and everyone in Southern California, the Dodgers and the Angels that never made the playoffs at the same time. I mean, if it continues like this in the first two games in the Dodgers series with St. Louis, I mean, it's been a whimper, mm -hmm. a whimper for Southern California. You know, a lot can change. Look at Erstad play first base. So Cabrera gone. Dave Rebson in the studio. David. Thanks Chris here with Steve Phillips reminding you Yanks and Twins at 8 Eastern here on ESPN. Kevin Brown against Carlos Silva has been great down the stretch. Steve how do you think the Twins react after Wednesday's heartbreak. Well this is a test for their resiliency. They're going to have to bounce back. I think it's important to get out early score some runs and get that Metrodome crowd supporting them. Then I think they have a chance to make a good, good ball game out of it. Steve Dave thank you Billy Miller up. And uh, again you, you saw them talk about it. John and Joe, Gary Miller, they'll have the game for you tonight. 
at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, and what will be a very loud Metrodome. And 5 o'clock on the West Coast. And now look, again, I, I don't want to suppose anything in the fifth inning. Big picture American League. Boston has a chance to finish this at supper time. Minnesota and the Yankees are in a are in a a death match yeah. there. So that could, you know, who knows? That could go five laborious games. Open up. Well, it'll open up at the winner of that series with Boston, the wild card team. But whatever, if Boston could finish off, they can get set. The other two teams playing hard nose, maybe five games. Advantage Boston, or are they hitting so well that three days off is not a good thing? If it happened, Tony. I, I think, uh, honestly, I think they're swinging the bats pretty well. I don't know if they would want that much time off. And, you know, they've had opportunities, and, and it's like we talked about, the Angels have given them some of them. Now, Miller starting to hit the ball well again. Two singles and reached and scored on an error. Now we started talking about some of the other series with the Red Sox here uh, having a chance to put the hammer down once and for all on the Angels. The Yankees uh, struggled just to get out of that extra inning game in game two to tie their series. The Dodgers uh, looking woeful in their first two games although they're going home against the, the uh, just a, a great lineup for St. Louis and the for Cal home run the rare shortstop home run to win a postseason game. Uh, it keeps that series at 1 1 with rampaging Houston. Oh, what a surprise! Johnny Damon with a base hit. So, Damon aboard three of his four times. Tony, you would know a lot more about offensively what it takes to keep it together than any of us, but the one thing that could help the Boston Red Sox by having that time off. I mean they, they pushed him to the limit with yep. that pitch count mm -hmm. in game two and you think about the right ankle of Kurt Schilling. Absolutely they want to get Schilling ready to go in game one regardless of who it's against but they'd also like to give him time and the, the training staff and the doctors to get that pain out of that right ankle get him as close to 100 percent as they can. Well and it would be a complete week for each yeah. Tuesday and Wednesday as uh, Brendan Donnelly who uh, did not pitch well obviously in uh, what he entered in game number two is up uh, throwing in the pen for Mike Sosha another we showed all the other series and they're shilling well this is what we want to look at this afternoon son. well just to see him out there tells you right there he's only going to go at about 50 percent you say well that's nothing like what we see in the game from him you don't see anything like that down there in the bullpen it's just kind of like taking your thoroughbred out for a little jog in the park hey were we on Johnny Damon here by the way yep. before we forget here were we, were, did we have a feeling that this would be a big series for him but we talked about him as the MVP of the American League and if not the MVP I mean he's got to be in the top five I, I think Vladimir will win the award because of what he did down the stretch but well, when you look at what Johnny Damon has done all year long the run scored the RBI the home runs the defense what a year there's Kurt Schilling out well, if he'd been out a minute ago, we'd have had him on, but he was up in the clubhouse listening to us. Yeah, well, he heard us talk well, he about it. He showed the video of him, and he came out so we could put him <laughs> on, on TV. Cue. He knew who our camera guys would find him. Well, he knew how to pay. It was not one of his great outings, but uh, hey, he came here to be with Pedro, ace and ace, and that's the position they I put love the Red what Sox they, in. they said in the Boston Globe. Not thrilling, just shilling. Yep. Just another postseason victory. Foul bat. You know what? I just want to get this while we're talking about pitching. We looked at all the other series. How about Joe Nathan going three innings? John Smoltz going three innings. Brad Lidge going three innings. When you know, can you tell it's the postseason? Yeah. I think that's what's going to test the Minnesota Twins, though. They were 64 and one during the regular season with the lead after seven innings. They had the lead against the Yankees but they came back and took that game away from their closer. So be it three inning. Will he be at 100 percent being able to go later on tonight and will they be as confident as they were going into game two. That's a, that's a tough thing for a young team. Well, Bellhorn does what he does often either walks or strikes out. He does that now. Two down and a guy that these fans think should be the MVP Manny Ramirez coming up Red Sox at home with 55 wins 
and have hit so well on the road. Hell in this series. Hello. 300 batting average. Lead the majors with almost six and a half runs a game. Well, just, and I'm sorry, Boo. Just ahead. to add to Rick's point here, I think you saw it in both cases. In the in a Minnesota game, Minnesota uh, Yankees game, Houston Atlanta game, both of those teams had a chance to be where the Red Sox are right now, leading two games to none. And when you had that opportunity to get down the right field side, and Manny, that will be foul. He almost had a home run down the right field yeah, line, Anaheim. almost a grand slam yeah. in Anaheim. And I think when you get to that 2-0 position. The game is a little bit easier. You can manage it a little bit easier. You can decide who you want to pitch with. You know, for a long time, they didn't know if they were going to go with Arroyo or Wakefield. Or you get a 2 nothing lead, you can go with the guy you want. You can rest your number one maybe in one more game. Instead of bringing him back three days, you can bring him back on four days. So getting to that position is such an advantage. That's why you saw the Twins go with Nathan. You saw Houston go with Lidge. Fisted for a base hit. Miller scores. Boston on the board again. 6 1 Sox. That'll be it for Shields. The Red Sox starting to pour it on. They can taste a move ahead. 6-1 now Boston with runners at the corners. They're threatening for more. They have knocked out the first reliever Scott Shields and now Brendan Donnelly normally outstanding in the pen but touched up in game number two as you can see the numbers as Boston got right on him. Pitched in that four run ninth in game two Wednesday night and if the Red Sox put it away and here's David Ortiz Ortiz has doubled twice so Ramirez with two RBIs Millar by the way gets an RBI the inning ago in the air to Eckstein so he has two Nixon a ribby Ortiz a ribby I mean it's everywhere mm -hmm. Ortiz and Manny Ramirez so close in their offensive numbers and and so close personally as well. Think back to the All-Star game when Manny hit that home run off Roger Clemens in the first inning. All of a sudden he had his second at bat. He took himself out of the ball game so that his buddy David Ortiz could come in. Ortiz walked in the fourth and then he too hit a home run in the Midsummer Classic during the sixth inning. Way up top. And that's a teammate, Tony. To, 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 I mean, Manny could have maybe been the MVP of that game. He could have had four or five at bats. And no, I'll let, let, I'll let my buddy get in there. I think that's the way the Red Sox play, too. They all get along. They all, you know, are pulling for one another and they all want to see each other do well. Manny Ramirez dancing I, around at first base. My see things? No, that caught my <laughs> eye too. I thought maybe. So wait a minute, Damon's at third. I thought maybe Ortiz saw him bluff a steal too, and maybe threw him off. But uh, you know, again, it just it just kind of goes to how the Red Sox are playing baseball right now. They're just playing real good team baseball. High cheese there from Donnelly, which we know we can throw. And Kona talked about, I mentioned earlier, Bill Miller not running, not being one of those guys. He said neither would he want Ortiz or Manny Ramirez to run because of one thing. He doesn't want to risk them getting hurt. I tell you what, though, watching this series, 2 2 pitch. As lumbering as they can be. Then you look at, at Vladimir Guerrero and Garrett Anderson on the other side of the fence. They're hurting. You know, Boston's moving better than they are. The yeah. big guys. Well, everybody on their feet. Red Sox fans smelling the kill. Instead, Ortiz frozen by Donnelly. So what a surprise a couple more stranded but what a surprise more runs scored by Boston. A hot time in the old town tonight. 
And speaking of twilight. How about the Red Sox fans Kurt Gowdy who called the Sox games for years and years and years and one of our all time favorites and Stephen King so a long time Red Sox fan Stephen lived out in Maine. So let's see if anything is written or spoken about the Red Sox. Those are two pretty good guys to have in those capacities. Huh? No question. And Stephen King writing a, uh, a book on this season just in case. Huh? That ball line to Manny Ramirez and looking very smooth out there. Sean Figgins is gone. Again, our aerial coverage for today's broadcast, AmeriQuest Airship Liberty. It's got Daniker, Corky Belanger. Uh, the Liberty is the airship of AmeriQuest Mortgage Company, the official mortgage company of Major League Baseball. All right, something lost in all the runners and all the runs. Kurt Schilling, ace, wins game one, gives up nine hits. Pedro Martinez, ace, wins game two, gives up six hits. Bronson Arroyo, man, okay, he's fifth your starter. fifth, fourth, now third starter. Here they are in the sixth, he's giving up two hits. I'd say he's one of the best fifth starters in all of baseball this well, year. Not the fifth anymore. You look at the man. ten wins that he had, only nine losses. You look at five and zero oh in his last nine starts. You mentioned earlier, Boomer, that Boston won all nine of those starts. Twenty-nine starts on the year, and they won seventeen of them. 27 years of age they found something that uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates for some reason didn't want up top to Darren Erstad one and two he's had great command of the breaking ball today been able to throw it for a strike on both halves locate his fastball been ahead most of the most of the day Just kind of came on, you know. I mean, it was his first full time season in the bigs, either with Pittsburgh, he was still up and down with them. Last year, won 12 games in Pawtucket before being on the postseason roster here and didn't pitch in the opening round against Oakland. And we told you he pitched three times against the Yankees, but he'll be pitching again this postseason. Well, you even got Pedro Martinez making nice defensive plays for them now, Tony. That's what happens when you throw strikes all the time. The defenders are ready. Look at See that. people I mean, running out of the way. There's Pedro right there at his glove. Wow. That looked very, that was smooth. Are they having a good time or what? Are they, ha I mean, are they having fun? No, it's easy to have fun when you have three big scores, although game two is a, was a, a nail biter until the end, but they're just enjoying what they've got here. And since middle August, it's been lights out. Erstad will send this one into the seats. There's something, I mean, you, you never know. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put this out there, okay, because I think I understand the fans here. I've been to this park many, many times as a paying customer for a dollar through those years out in the bleachers where. Those great teams in the 60s, uh, most notably the 70s. And Erstad gets on. I, I just, if they get to the ALCS and the Yankees aren't there, I'm talking fans now, the players don't care. The Yankees aren't there and they play the Twins and happen to beat the Twins and go on to win the World Series and end the curse of the Bambino. Will they be happy enough here because they didn't go through the Yankees? Yes, of course, a purist would say they win the World Series, and I'm not suggesting that they are, but if they don't play the Yankees, will it be complete? Or one other part, and I'm just going to let it linger. If they beat the Yankees, if that's the way it goes, and get in the World Series against St. Louis and have a noble seven-game stand, as they did in 67 and 46, but lose to the Cardinals, who are the best record in baseball, but beat the Yankees, is that going to be good enough? I, You're the Swami. Hey, I'm <laughs> Tony and I, we're still in our head. I, the, 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 I'm just telling you Boston fans out there, think about that, because I asked quite a few long-timers today, and they said this will be something missing if they win the whole. I said, come on, they haven't won since 1918. And again, we're a long way off from this series, too. But, you know, one thing. These are had, dilemmas that they're going to have. I'm telling you. I know. I know what I'm talking about. You know, one thing that hadn't been missing here all year long for the first time in the 92 year history of this ballpark is an empty seat. Every ticket to every game That's was sold amazing. this year. 
and you know who deserves the credit. I mean, he he did it in Baltimore with Camden Yard. He went to San Diego and helped get the new stadium built there, Tony. Yes, did. I mean, this is Larry Lucchino yes, and his staff that have put together this atmosphere here. That I mean, I mean, this is a. They've always compared Fenway to Wrigley and what have you. I, I didn't see a comparison until the last couple of years. Yeah. It is, it is, it is right there now with the friendly confines. Yeah, John Henry and Kino and Theo Epstein and Tom Warner and you mentioned the names. Mike D. Guerrero, meanwhile, big strikeout for Arroyo, number seven for him. Arroyo deserves a whole lot of credit. He's done nothing today but throw strikes. Well, I, I, I think what Boomer said too, Tony, this, he mentioned Theo Epstein. And the thing about Theo, the reason this team was able to evolve is because he has done such a great job evaluating. Right. He was the one that said Bronson Arroyo is a guy that can pitch for. He's the one that agreed with Terry Francona. Yeah, he's our he's our third game guy. He had the guts to pull some you, know, you don't just trade a symbol of the franchise and expect it to go away. But here they are and it's not that Nomar is going to be a great player somewhere else as he was a great Red Sox. But you, you know, and that takes some guts to even pull a trigger on a move like that. Well they knew he wasn't going to be healthy all year. Mm -hmm. That Achilles problem was not going to go away and they needed defense to get to where they're at and they were able to come up with it because Theo made the move that everybody said he shouldn't do. Well see I think it's a little bit more than that too Rick. I think it's not only did they know he wasn't going to play but I think there was some question as to whether or not he was going to come back next year. So and from sure. player standpoint yeah. you know they're winning they're in the hunt they're fighting trying to get to this position and you you know you kind of that question was lingering all almost all summer long and they had to make a decision and and when they made it that that disappeared we kind of focused in on what the job at hand was playing baseball off the glove of Arroyo can Anderson beat it out yes he can so very quietly with a walk and a little infield chopper for Garrett Anderson who now has two hits after having none going into this game and Anaheim is two on and you hear the hush you know why there's a hush because of the noise made off the bat of the man at home plate right now there's going to be a discussion on the mound right now because Troy Gloss could put the Angels right back in this thing the pitching coach Dave Wallace uh, Waterbury Connecticut native out on the hill he's done a good job huh he knows it he knows pitching that's for darn sure you know that from the Dodger system set. He's been responsible for helping a lot of young pitchers become major league starters, relievers, have a lot of success. Alan Embry, the lefty, up in the pen. Gloss would not necessarily be the guy uh, to deal with. How about this home run that uh, it shattered the Coke bottles? Just and there's <laughs> a new sound effect that was disc two, Tony. Gloss fouls this one off. Well, what does Wallace go out and just say? We, I mean, Arroyo remembers it was a long home run. What do you tell him? If you walk him, it's not the worst thing. Because that's why they're getting Emory ready. Because we know, Tony, about the drop-off in the Anaheim Angel lineup after Troy Gloss. And the, and the other thing is Gloss is the only one who's taken a good, a real good whack at that breaking ball. Everybody else has been way out in front. Look at where Veritek was sitting up. Just to show him that fastball out there. And now my guess would be you come back with the breaking ball somewhere near that location by design. Now Linfield pulled around the second baseman Bellhorn not exactly behind second but certainly pulled way over and guarding the line of third is Miller and that is hit in the hole but ready for it is Cabrera and the force over to Bellhorn and two is stranded. The Red Sox are nine outs away from moving on to the ALCS. They built it. If you build it, they will win. Thank you, Theo. 30 years of age. Huh? And having the guts to make the calls. And first he got last year putting together the, the, the quote, the traveling idiots, if you will, the, the Millars and the Millers and the, you know, the, the kind of the, the dirt balls, which is an affectionate baseball term. And, uh, you know, they had Trot Nixon was already here, but he certainly fits into that category. And then, you know, Giving him the purse strings to go out and sign a shilling, go out and get a closer in folk. 
Uh, and then the guts to make the move with Nomar and to get the defense like Cabrera and Mankiewicz. They make the little moves, the Dave Roberts mm -hmm. type moves. Uh, Mike Myers. Yeah, Mike Myers type move. Liskanic they come up with. I mean, it's all been really impressive pieces for a team that won 98 games. And I might add, more wins than the last three Red Sox World Series teams. More than 86, more than 75, more than 67. Just. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. They're, they're good. This is a good team. There's no question. But Thiel's done a nice job. Trot Nixon, other way. But that's right at Jeff Devaney. Well, Nixon's starting to swing a better bat. Let's head to the studio, fellas. Thanks, Chris. Dave Reps and Steve Phillips with you. High drama Wednesday night. Hideki Matsui, the sack fly in the 12th to even the Yanks series with the Twins in one. Which team has more pressure tonight in game three, Steve? Well, I think the Twins have to bounce back from a tough loss, but I think they have home field advantage. The pressure is on the Yankees, especially with the specter of Johan Santana scheduled to pitch game four. Kevin Brown against Carlos Silva, 8 Eastern ESPN. Kevin Millar up. Thank you, David. Steve? We'll be tuning in tonight, that's for sure. You know, I... It's just buzz. What a weekend of sports this could be up here in New England. The New England Patriots are going to set the all-time NFL record if they can beat Miami at home at 1 o'clock of 19 straight wins over two seasons. The Red Sox have a chance to move forward to the American League Championship Series. Back-to-back -back appearances there, and that doesn't happen. Well, that doesn't happen here. And they make the postseason, but as far as getting there, not the case for them. No. So uh, talk about professional sports activity, you know, that'll be in the history books happening on this weekend. They should enjoy it. I mean, I think the players are. I think oh, we the see that are enjoying it. every day. It just uh, I'm just kind of walking around town today. I just didn't get that sense. I just got a sense of that people, this was too easy. That they were holding their breath. They couldn't believe that uh, their team has played this well. And granted, now the Angels have not really helped themselves defensively in this series. But, I mean, let's face it, the Red Sox have really swung the bats pretty well. Kyle Peterson with a special guest. I think we know him. Kyle? Yeah, down here with Peter Gammons. And Peter, season ticket holder here for 20 years. What makes this place, what makes Fenway so unique? Well, first of all, fans here anticipate almost like play-by-play -play broadcasters. I mean, it's amazing the passion you get here. But fans are so crazy. I mean, I counted 10 or 12 kids wearing Mark Bellhorn jerseys. Where else in the world would somebody be wearing a Mark Bellhorn jersey? Arroyo tonight, who's, who's been so good. Last year called up in September, uh, but it never really had a full season in the big leagues. What's changed for him this year? Well, the last couple of years, the last year with the Pirates, and then the first year after they claimed him on waivers here, he just got more and more command of the strike zone. You look at his walk strikeout ratio, it changed every year. And it was funny this last winter. I, I have this fundraiser, uh, a rock and roll concert every winter, and Theo Epstein and his band plays, I my band plays, but Boston asked if he could get up on stage and play. So I said, oh, sure, he got up. He got up and he did an absolutely perfect version of Pearl Jam's Black. And Theo and I looked at each other and, you know, he said, he's got it. <laughs> he was in the rotation after doing Pearl Jam. That's all it took. The last one, the Twins and Yankees follow us right after this game. What you take on that series? Who you think is going to pull that one out? Well, I really believe that if the Yankees are going to go a long way, Kevin Brown has to win. And I, my guess is, I know he really wants to redeem himself. He was terribly embarrassed about breaking his hand. I think he's going to come up huge, right? and I think he's going to be a major factor the rest of the way. Peter, thanks for taking the time. Great to see you. Come down and sit here anytime. All right, sounds good. Boom. Kyle, tell Peter you got an in now with Steven Tyler at his next rock and roll concert. <laughs> that that would bring the doors down. <laughs> Strike to Jason Veritek. Got a lot of guitar players on that Boston Red Sox team. Johnny Damon picking it up. I don't know if he can play guitar like his boys can, but no. Theo Epstein. Well, he looks is. like he should be a guitar player. Very, very much, I, I think, a member of the, of the Doors. We were enjoying listening to the Doors last night. At any rate, the Doors starting to get slammed shut on the Angels. Can they bring Rick Sutcliffe, Tony Gwynn, Kyle Peterson with you? 6 1 Boston over Anaheim. Steven Tyler, Stephen King, Peter Gammons, Kurt Gowdy, Kurt Gowdy. and Doug Mankiewicz. Doug Bat. Mankiewicz 
Although he's in there for being a glove man, tries to come on again, as Kevin Millar said, his third save of the, se of the uh, series at first base. Millar goes six. Here's Mankiewicz in there for defense. As Devanin Molina McPherson, 6 7 8 for Anaheim. Running out of innings, running out of outs against Bronson Arroyo, who has come and uh, most notably a better road pitcher than in Boston, but he can pitch like this, he can pitch on the moon. What an outing that he has had following up Pedro and Schilling's outings. Anaheim with just three hits and the one run. You know how kids like to emulate their heroes. I mean, I'm I'm just afraid that as well as he's pitching today, we're gonna we're gonna see corn rolls <laughs> all around the little league. <laughs> Too hard to do though. Tony, they'll listen to you. Will you tell them those corn rolls have nothing to do with how well he's pitching? Uh, absolutely nothing. Mike Timlin, who is impressed very much so what? in this series, and the lefty, that uh, wild and crazy guy, Mike Byers, is up with the. Uh, the submarine delivery from the port side. Devannon walks, and we talked about the traveling quote idiots, self-described by the Red Sox, Johnny Damon. Terry Francona says, I love these guys. I care about us playing the game right, you know, respecting the game, and by that I mean trying to play it right. I think we do that, regardless of the length of our hair or, or the beard they may have or whatever, the way they dress, they enjoy playing baseball. And because of that, those three hours or whatever we have during the game are the most pleasurable for me by far. That says it all, right? The three hours, play it right. Says it right. Says it well for the professional level. I'm sure uh, college or high school level, you're going to be a little bit concerned about well, grades and stuff, but it really doesn't matter. Terry Francona has come out to the mound, and everybody on their feet for Bronson Arroyo. The Red Sox lit up the scoreboard again. Bronson Arroyo was stellar on the mound. So he leaves pitching into the seventh inning with just three hits. Well, a year ago in the minor leagues, he pitched a perfect game, but that will pale in comparison, Tony, to what he did out there, what started to be this afternoon. It's a pretty good run here as Mike Myers, the lefty, who will uh, really scrape the dirt with his knuckles to deliver. The, as you pointed out, said earlier, let's see, uh, Royal on the mound when they clinched a playoff berth last time. He had a three inning outing in Baltimore over the weekend just to stay sharp. Now, the next week, okay, he's on the mound and perhaps they clinch a division series. What's next? Well, I tell you what Mike Myers coming in did. This is Jose Molina pitching, uh, pinch hitting for the announced pinch hitter Casey Kotsman when Francona went out. So, Mike Myers essentially got rid of two guys off of Mike Socha's bench here. Jose Molina eventually is batting for the catcher Benji Molina. He's going to get rid of more than that mm -hmm. because McPherson's heading back to the dugout now, and Adam Riggs has come out to the on deck circle. So you bring Myers in and you use up three guys. And you use up three, you could use up three guys. But if you're Mike Socia right now, Tony, you manage, you got to go for it now. Yeah. You're not going to pinch hit for anybody in those nope. first five. You, you, whatever bullets you have in your gun on your bench, you, you, you got to put them in the chamber. Yeah. So a lefty, a lefty pitching, you go with righty hitters. You're going to try to play the percentages here. And take two here. Oh, I would take two. 3-0 the count to Jose Molina Devannon with a walk at first. In there for a strike. So that's one thing take that, again. That Meyer, that's what I would. But that's one base thing runners. Myers has done different Boomer this year. He, he really struggled with right handers the last couple of years. You see him now at times going back up top. Mm -hmm. he's, he's changed that release point and he's been more effective along with that. Well two walks have put two on for the Angels. They have come back twice in the postseason from five run deficits including a World Series game that will be talked about for centuries. In game six against San Francisco. Can they do they have another one in their holster. So here as you describe as Adam Riggs 
And now Terry Francona is out and we expect to see Mike Timlin. So the wheels turning here in the seventh inning as the Angels just try anything to get back in the game and the Red Sox are trying anything to keep them at bay. The seventh Chris Berman Rick Sutcliffe Tony Gwynn and our ESPN crew as we look at nighttime now on Fenway the Angels trying to hold off nighttime in their season. They've gotten two walks and now the wheels are turning Mike Timlin who is now pitching all three games of this series was uh, pitched two strong ones in game number one struck out the side actually in the ninth he comes on to face well was announced first Adam Riggs as the pinch hitter for Dallas McPherson but now is Curtis Pry. So these two slots have had six players in them if yeah. you will because they're all pinch hitters in the first place. Well, you're down five runs you got to try to figure out a way to put some runs on the board to get back into this ball game. Miller in on the grass at third pride runs well in case he drops one but you wouldn't think that's what he's doing unless he's looking for a base hit. Yeah, I'm thinking he's looking to get a ball and maybe drive a ball in the gap and get a run home and get themselves in scoring position because at this at this point you need runs. They're hard to come by off of this guy. And Timlin's how's that, been, how's that? been very good. His whole Red Sox bullpen has been very good. This is great to see both managers do exactly the right thing. I mean, this is the last thing Mike Sosha can do as a manager. Uh, you're not going to pinch it with Josh Paul or Embezzica. They're not going to hit for any of the guys you've already got out there. He's at the bottom part of the order, Tony. He's just trying to turn, turn it, over it over to the top part of the order exactly. and maybe get Vladimir up there as the tying run yeah. somehow, some way. That's exactly right. You just you're trying to get some guys on base so that when the order turns around. You might have a chance to score. And how about just basically a story and perseverance by a young man, Curtis Pride. Deaf, you know, a great, a great athlete. Boy, a great basketball player from the Washington, D.C. area. And played with the Expos. He had been around and, it, you know, hardship, forget about it. He's, he's smiling on his face every day. And here he is with a chance to do something in the postseason. You yep. love hearing stories like that. Ooh. Just as we loved and in game two watching Jim Abbott throw out the oh, first yeah. pitch and just a remarkable career that he had. Brian just hoping as you mentioned to get something going then maybe little Eckstein can get a little sting on something. And you're right a couple of yeah, Aristide Guerrero coming but first things first Timlin they had one and two with two on and none out. Tried to deep the van and he got back there quickly, but ball was snared by Cabrera, and there's one out. I don't know, Tony, thinking, you know, about it again. Why not let it bounce right now? Maybe, yeah. You let it bounce now. You tag the bag first. You tag the runner. You just got yourself a double play there. But you know, sometimes those balls can take some funny hops. Yeah. You know, you look at that infield. There's been a lot of traffic out there around that area. It hits off one of those footprints and and kicks into the outfield. You, you know, he did the right thing. And the other thing, this is a playoff game. Maybe in a regular season game, you do that. Sure. Things happen. Sure. You, sometimes your mind doesn't think that clearly when things are happening quickly. Well, they're counting outs right now. Yeah, they are. Right, they got eight left. And that's that's what you're doing. You're in this situation. You're trying to get outs. You'll give up a run to get an out. David Eckstein 0 for 2 has made an error. We told you at the beginning of the game came up in the Red Sox farm system years ago. Tim in there for strike two. Boy, 38 years and throwing as strong as he ever has. A couple of world championship rings, Mike Timlin with Toronto in 92 and 93. Has a chance at another one. Little flare Eckstein and that's what we're talking about the runners had to hold and so therefore that's why barreling into second was Jose Molina but here we go 
Bases loaded for Anaheim on two walks and a flare with one out. The top of the order, Sean Figgins up, then Erstad and Guerrero. And Figgins, like Eckstein, is a guy that's been getting on base all year long, Tony. If he's able to do that now, you bring up some power in Erstad. He's already hit a home run in this series. You got Vladimir after that. I mean, Mike Sosha has done everything he yes, can do. He has. Yep. Good job, Sud. He has. They're in a position to get in it. And they've battled and scraped, scraped and clawed, and that's a great at bat by Eckstein. That ball's out of the zone, up high. He fights it off into right field to load the bases. And if if Figgins could get on or or just prolong the inning, now you got some guys who are capable of hitting the ball out of the ballpark, coming to the plate. Fight and claw. Isn't that what Anaheim has done all year long? Yeah, I was going expect that's nothing it. less. And they're they're not going to just fold their tent. They're going to keep scratching and clawing, trying to get back in. It's only only the seventh inning. What's the last thing Socia told us in the manager's meeting? See you guys tomorrow morning. He meant it too. Yeah, of course. However, Figgins goes out with some high cheese from Timlin. You got to feel a little bit sorry for that young man. Yeah. He, he's, he's a big part of the reason Figgins is that they got to the postseason, but uh, it has been difficult for him yeah. uh, since he's, this series has started. There have been some players much better than him. Bonds, Bonilla, think of the Pittsburgh. You think of our friends on the Astros, Bagwell, Biggio, no longer having that trouble, so he's not alone. Meanwhile, the lefty Allen Embry continues to throw, and the dangerous Darren Erstad is up with the bases loaded. Erstad 0 for 2 with a walk. 4 for 9 in the series, and hello off one of the crossbars down there in one of the seats. The ball came in there quick. So Devan and the runner at third base and Jose Molina is he hurt. Oh boy. That wasn't a crossbar. And he just had no chance. Oh then you could do that close. That's tough. I hope he's all right. Devan and Molina. Eckstein. Liskanic also up the right hander Curtis Liskanic. Stad. He goes fishing. It's 0-2, and, and now everybody in the sellout crowd on their feet. That was a nasty sinking fastball. Perfect location. That's how you pitch as well in the postseason as Timlin has by making pitches like that. He's got to make one more. Are these not two hard-nosed guys right here, Timlin and Nerstad, huh? You feel the grinding going on? Yep, neither one's going to give it, give an inch. Just setting everything up, as Veritek has done throughout this series. He set up Vladimir Guerrero with a huge out in game two. He's trying to do the same thing to Erstad here. You see all of the signs? On the line, but foul. Comes right back, Tony, after showing that high, hard fastball with an off speed pitch down and away. He thought he could get him right here. There it is. Look at that perfect location down. Just a great piece of hitting by Erstad to stay in this at bat. Now they'll go out and talk. I mean, this is Veritech taking charge here. He said, you know what? I just did my thing. All right. I mean, you got to give him credit. I didn't, I weren't able to get him out. What do you think right now? Mm -hmm. Let's let's be thinking on the same page. Because you don't want to face the guy no, in the on deck circle don't. as the tie and run. That's why this at bat right here is huge. And he went for the kill and the ball away. Erstad did a great job of just fouling off. Erstad waits it out to two and two. One yeah. pitch away from our favorite. Yep. Tony, you watch both of these guys, though. You just, they don't even hear the crowd right no. now, do they? They've no. got that calm that, and, that, and that confidence that you just, you feel like. If you're social, you feel like Erstad's going to get on. If you're Francona, you feel like Tim is going to get him out. Yep. All right, here we go. Now it's the best moment in baseball. Three and two, two out. 
Bases loaded. Everybody moving. So Devanin, Jose Molina, David Eckstein on the move. Timlin staring in. Erstad digging in. So Erstad, after 0-2, draws a walk. And Vladimir Guerrero coming up with the bases juiced. 6-2. He did it, Tony. He did it. Mike Sosha created this opportunity for his possible MVP of the American League with one swing of the bat, as bad as things have been. Yep. Offensively, defensively, you lost your starting pitcher in the fourth inning. He could be tied. Vlad swinging at the first pitch again as he's done so often this yep. series strike one. Well, Timlin ran that ball in on him. They know what they know the situation. The last thing Timlin wants to do is leave a ball out over the middle of the plate to Guerrero could you know, possibly get up and drive out of here. So you know he's still got to focus in on making good pitches. He hits this ball a long way to right. Back it goes. Back, back, back. Gone. Tied up. A game that seemed so easy. So much of a foregone conclusion. Is now tied. Out of nowhere have come the Angels. The silence deafening. Rick, you set it up. That's that's this is exactly what Social wanted. He wanted to give his guy an opportunity to maybe tie this game with one swing and a bat. And look at that. Vladimir Guerrero has not touched home plate in this series until right now. I think he picked the perfect spot. Mike Timlin has been automatic for two years until right now. That's why they play the whole game. Vladimir Guerrero noticed by his silence in this series, silent no more. Grand Slam has changed everything as the Angels scrapping, clawing, as Sutton, Tony, you've described, and we now have a new game. Mike Timlin has been outstanding, but Guerrero took him deep on a pitch that well, we'll show it to you. And now Garrett Anderson, who quietly has had two hits, goes up against the left-hander Alan Embry. Embry, fittingly, as Mount St. Helens starts to erupt from Vancouver, Washington, where that volcano is, he's coming in to try to quell this angel eruption. Good breaking ball there by Embry. A guy that uh, throws a high percentage of fastballs too. I agree with you, Tony. He wouldn't have moved around as much as he has if he'd have been that consistent with that breaking ball. He's been real good in that Red Sox uniform. Seventh inning when they're down by five runs. Those Anaheim Angels. Where have we seen this before? Got some giant fans yeah, that are mad man. at you right no, now. I'm one of them. I'm mad at me. <laughs> well, I think it's a testament to Mike Social. Yep. I These agree. guys did not quit. They kept pecking away, and, and it wasn't glamorous at bats oh, by no. by Molina or by uh, Eckstein. They just battled, gave themselves a chance. Er Ex Erst at the last at bat, you know, the 3 2 walk after being down 0 2, and Guerrero comes up and does what power hitters number three hitters number four hitters are supposed to do he drove in the road. The stunned crowd trying to help Embry now a little chopper by Garrett Anderson Bellhorn to Mankiewicz and the Angels are gone but not until a grand slam from Vladimir Guerrero five in all seventh inning stretch and all of a sudden we got a tie ball game. 
ESPN's Major League Baseball Division Series. Presented by Budweiser. Budweiser, grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. Evening in Boston, a stunned Boston. Because Vladimir Guerrero's Grand Slam has helped the Angels hang a five spot in a game that Boston seemingly had in hand. And a bunch of at bats to load the bases, quality at bats, and the pitch right over the heart of the plate. Yeah, that ball is supposed to be in under Vladimir Guerrero's knuckles. Instead, it's out over the plate, and he does what, what he's supposed to do. He knew it as soon as he hit it. The Angels are back to even, and we got a new ball game. Now, Mike Sosha spent about an hour out, an hour, about two minutes out there with uh, with Rungi showing all the changes that he's making. He just about used everyone now with the double pinch hitters in two of the spots as Myers came in and then Timlin came in and Vladimir Guerrero. Well, maybe he just needed the sun to go down there in right field and in center field and everything has changed. For Mike Timlin, look, there's no way he's trying to throw the pitch there, Sutton. It's, it's, there's a human element involved in this game and one of the most powerful humans in baseball was the top free agent on everybody's list over the winter that being Vladimir Guerrero but credit has to go to their owner Artie Moreno for coming up with the money creating the opportunity to sign this guy and Mike Sosha managing there in the top of the seventh as well he gave up his whole bench but he knew he had to that's his one shot right there to try to get Vladimir up as a tying run and Mike Sosha and his bench got it done. Well now Boston fans I can hear the murmur. Man, we showed you the first night in 1986 uh, Angels about to go to the World Series Dave Henderson the home run and they win in extra innings and then they go on and win game six and seven. Now they're saying uh oh could it come back now we're up 2 0 up 6 1 and. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. You saw Figgins move around. A Mezica, who started game one at second base, is in. Figgins is at third. And now, all of a sudden. The Red Sox now need to rally. And all those left on base. Is it two in the first five innings in each inning? Ten runners left yeah. on base. That's six one. What difference does it make? That's what a lot of people thought too. Mm -hmm. Is that and we, we kind of touched on it early. They had they were leaving guys on base in every inning, and even though they had a lead, they really had an opportunity to blow this thing open. And it really didn't show itself until Guerrero's ball went out of the ballpark, and now all of a sudden it's a six six game. Talk about a story of perseverance as Cabrera strikes out. Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Here's Dave Revson in the studio. Thanks, Boomer. Here with Steve Phillips. Sports Center after the game, then Yanks and Twins, pivotal third game. What are you looking for out of this pitching matchup, Steve? Well, two sinker ball pitchers. They've got to keep the ball in the ballpark. I think the guy who keeps the bullpen in the bullpen the longest will be the most successful. Again, that one, 8 Eastern on ESPN. Boomer. All right, fellas, we'll be watching there. Meanwhile, Bill Miller up. He's been on base all three times, two singles. He's gotten on an error by Figgins, the second baseman, and has scored two runs. He pops this up, and Erstad is there at first. And Billy Miller is gone. And now that Brendan Donnelly came in, two outs in the fifth to settle and to strand two bases in the fifth inning, two on base. Pitched to one, two, three, six, and did his part to get the Angels to get to this point. There's Frankie Rodriguez back to Donnelly. The nose broken on a drive back through the box in spring training. Three different surgeries. There's another perseverance story. We talked about the, the big life picture of a, a fellow like Curtis Pride. Donnelly's gone through something that an excruciating year in many ways. And here well, he is. We've seen pitchers, and he wasn't on the mound when he got hit, but we've seen pitchers that have been hit by a baseball yeah, who right. have never come back to be the same. We, we've seen the same thing with hitters. Credit to this guy for coming back and pitching well. well it's kind of a freak one right in the outfield or it just uh, but it wasn't right after one surgery either. You know and, and you say well what was he doing out there. I, I, Mike Sosha is a manager who hates to have his pitchers shag. 
Tony doesn't want him out there. They said, "All oh, they're going to they? they're going to get hurt. We'll get other people out there that are more comfortable." But he was there. He's back, and he is throwing well. Well, so much for Donnelly not delivering in game two. He's delivered here with seven straight outs, tied, headed to the eighth. Back at Fenway Park in Boston. The Angels have battled from way back to tie this thing at six as we head to the top of the eighth inning. And the dangerous Troy Gloss coming to the plate. Gloss, who had an absolute bomb off the Coke bottles earlier in this game. That's the one, the five you see there, four of them, courtesy of Vladimir Guerrero's shot into the Angel bullpen. And here is Gloss against the lefty Allen Embry. Interesting matchup for itself. He couldn't wait to get in the batter's box against the left-handed pitcher. I mean, you got to figure Troy Gloss loving anybody from the left side. He has faced Allen Embry before, and one of the three hits went out of the ballpark. So here is Embry, who came on after the slam by Guerrero to get Garrett Anderson. Here's where it comes tough though for Mike Sosha. He needs a run in the worst way yeah. here because then he doesn't have to overextend Donnelly right. Tony. He can go to K Rod and then have Percival for the night. But if he doesn't get the run here he has gone through a lot of those arms down there already. Embry just appeared briefly. Got one out in game number one but he like Timlin pitched eight of the 12 postseason games last year for Boston. Very quickly the count 2 and 0 as Embry's got to be careful with Gloss. Came in on him a little bit. That ball will be out of play. He throws hard. He's one of the hardest throwing left handed really. I mean he's not Billy Wagner but he's just what Tony a yeah. notch below that yeah. you faced him. Yeah he throws extremely hard. The thing about it is straight though you know and. and a guy like Troy Glaus, he, he realizes where he is at the Angels lineup right now. He's looking for a ball that maybe he can drive out right center field, right field. Getting to the bottom, bottom third of that, uh, of the Angels lineup where they pinch hit and you got guys like, you know, Molina still down there, Devannon still down there. You know, you're looking for a quick strike. Troy's uh, had his opinions in the box. He's got a reason to be upset. We saw one just like that earlier in the ball game that was called a strike on him. Big, big difference, Tony, between three and one and a count that's two and two. Yep. Center coming on Damon. Got a good jump on the ball because Gloss takes such a big swing. And the dangerous Gloss is out with one out here in the eighth. October, eight teams, one champion. The race to the World Series is on, and you can catch all the action on ESPN and ESPN2. Don't miss it. It's a little late for me to tell you that. It's Friday. We've been going since Tuesday, all these series, but just a weekend reminder. One of those if things you watch this game on your hand in school. If, you know, you, if you've watched this game, I'm sure that 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 reminds you that anything can happen in these playoff series. Ah! In there for a strike to Jeff Devannon, whose seemingly harmless walk was the last batter that Bronson Arroyo faced. Went out to a big standing ovation as well he should have, and Francona making the right move at that point. He goes, all right, Arroyo, far enough. There's a walk. And that ball bounced. Away. I don't really disagree with anything Terry Francona has done. The, the one thing that he will be questioned about after the game was the Erstad at bat. You had Embry up and throwing. If you get Erstad out, you don't have to face Vladimir Guerrero in that big five run seventh inning. But when you look at the numbers, Erstad actually had a much higher average against Embry than he did Timlin. So now you know why, right? What you got left handed you, you know, know going to be all why. over. Yeah, we know why. He made the right situation. move. Timlin just made a mistake with his location. Yeah. Tony pointed that out. And missed. Timlin hadn't made many mistakes hadn't made, lately. Really hadn't made any. Any. He just missed. He missed location on the wrong guy, which was correct. One and two now to Jeff Devan and his Embry. 
So he lives up where Randy Myers, another uh, interesting bullpen ace. Lefty in Vancouver, Washington, another lefty. Uh, I guess only lefties live in the shadow of the volcano. Huh? <laughs> See that picture in the paper? Guy sitting in his seat just out there with a the cooler alone with binoculars watching the volcano steam. Yep, Emery just misses there, and the count now full. Tony Mickey Hatcher is talking about the van and how he, you know, with all the injuries, he has filled in at all three outfield positions, but how he has so matured as far as his at bats are concerned. You see that? Yeah, I, 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 and I think it happens when you get consistent at bats. And with these guys being injured, he's gotten a chance to play some center, some right, some left, and going out every day and getting some consistent at bats. And as you get at bats, you get more confident. So it just starts with talent, obviously. Yeah, it does. And then it comes with playing time. But playing time allows you to kind of test out all this stuff people are, are trying to teach. You know, the box score will show 0 for 2 for Jeff Devannon. That's the second walk he's grabbed in late inning play. Terry Francona will make a move. We'll be back. Chris Berman, Rick Sutcliffe, Tony Gwynn. Kyle Peterson with you here at Fenway. Quiet Fenway. 6 1 Sox has turned into 6 6 here in the top of the eighth. The Angels have the go ahead runner on, and Jeff Devanna with a walk with one out. And now the catcher, Jose Molina, is on against the Red Sox closer, Keith Folt. We told you Joe Nathan pitched three, Brad Lidge pitched three, John Smoltz pitched three. So here we are. Tie game, eighth, and the Red Sox closer, Keith Folt, on. First pitch way up top. Well, you get an opportunity to run here, Tony. You got a right hander on the mound. Devannon, 18 for 21, a stolen base department. You don't look for a whole lot of power out of Jose Molina. He, he's a backup catcher. I mean, maybe a little bit of motion, maybe a hit and run. Maybe just a flat stolen base. Yeah, maybe. A new pitcher in the game. Just after that last inning, all the moves Soch made to pay off like it did. He, he needs you gotta a recliner. You got to figure he's he's got the hot hand right now. <laughs> Anything he pulls out might work for him. He's so. the guy in that seat looking at the volcano. That's exactly right. You just they don't have a lot of moves left, but there's one of them. He oh, hitting shot. and running. Took a shot at it. Away. Good jump by Devanna. Yeah, Devanna had a good jump. Molina had a tough pitch to try to handle. He tried to hit it to the right side. And you know by a guy swinging at a pitch like yeah. that that it was the hit and run, and Mike Sosha did try to play that hot hand. There it is. You see him take off. You see him look back at the hitter to see where the baseball was. Outstanding base running there by the young outfielder. Was a work group. Go ahead, Seth. Count you hit and run on, would you say, most of the time with San Diego State? Actually, at State, we hit usually one strike. Kind of let, let, let the hitter get ahead where gotcha. you, you figure he's going to get a good pitch to hit. Nothing doing on the base pass there, and a big swing and miss from Jose Molina. Full pitch and inning in the third. Wednesday's game. A little slider in a perfect location. You folk a different sort of closer, not the flamethrower yeah. that you, you get with a guy with 35 in the 40 season saves. Best pitch is this changeup, but he's got a pretty good, pretty fastball, good little breaking ball. Other way and foul for Molina. Well, Ricky, you were asking me as a coach when I like to play hit and run. As a player, I love to do it with two strikes. Because really, with two strikes, that's kind of the last thing they would expect. And if you were a guy, you know, that could handle the bat, there'd be plenty holes to shoot at with two strikes. So, so she's not going to do that here. And so, if the van decides to go, it's going to be a straight steal on his part. But I kind of, I kind of agree with Sosha in the sense that. You know, the Red Sox have really just tried to put the pressure on the Angels, and the Angels haven't been the ones to, re to, to, to respond. And now you get even, and now you kind of want to get back to playing the kind of baseball that got you here. They need to be aggressive here. He was going. Well, mm. oh, you're right. And why not? I mean, you, you don't expect a lot of offense from Molina. You don't expect a lot from Amezica. I mean, he's a guy that 
that had very few hits all year long. He was leaning right there. I mean, I wouldn't just let him steal second, steal third, and then try a suicide squeeze. I mean, it, you just don't look for those big base hits from from these guys if you're Mike Sosha. If he gets thrown out, I mean, uh, you know, he gets thrown out. Here he goes, fisted, Damon there, and Devanna's going to have to sprint it back. So two outs. That ball didn't quite hit the blimp, but again, we thank our friends at AmeriQuest Airship Liberty, the Airship AmeriQuest Mortgage Company, the official mortgage company of Major League Baseball. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate the views. It's been picturesque late afternoon and now early evening. Boy, you know, the leaves going to change up here in about 10 days. Usually Columbus Day in northern New England is a great ride for Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine to see the leaves. And then out of Massachusetts about five, seven days later. And then uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island about five days after that. The leaves have changed in this game thanks to Vladimir Guerrero's grand slam in the seventh to make it a tie game. This is Alfredo Amezica who went into play second base. After the double pinch hit spot, Riggs and then Pride the last time around in this spot, the eight hole. Mm. Good change up right there by four. This reminds you a lot of Trevor Hoffman, doesn't it? Hoffman's had a little bit, has a lot more movement, I think, but. Same kind of same success. Same kind of, yeah, same kind of success because they take so much off of it. Uh, Folk, usually in a position of a save situation, he's hoping that he can come away with a win. Pitch out, nothing going. You know, people will blame Francona saying, you know, it didn't work there. I, I blame Keith Folk there. You got to come set a little bit longer and give give that base runner a chance to get going. He came set and kind of quick pitched him. He had no chance to run there. You got to sell that pitch out a little bit better than, than what he was able to do there. Tough spot to send the runner though. Yeah, if it he is. gets thrown out, you don't want a Mezica leading off in the top of the ninth inning. I think he's got to sit and watch. There you go. I mean, you got rid of him. He's, you know, I mean, he's out of the way. You can get extra in leading off the top of the ninth. Folk got rid of him there. It was all socks until Vladimir Guerrero got involved. That's A Rod you just saw. You're going to see K Rod in a minute on the mound. As uh, two, three, four for the Red Sox coming up, but our game track brought to you by Bristol Myers Squibb, Manny Ramirez, a pair of RBIs, including that single. Boston in front, six one until a five spot. The last four with the slam by Vladimir Guerrero in the seventh. And we are anew at six six, heading to the bottom of the eighth inning. Bellhorn Ramirez Ortiz coming in against. Francisco Rodriguez and how about the job that Donnelly did didn't pitch well at all and the Red Sox a ninth inning in game number two seven up seven down for him. Well Mike Sosha got what he wanted Tony when he went into the series he wanted it to be a battle of the bullpen he just didn't want to get into that bullpen in the fourth inning when he had two tonight. Starts Mark Bellhorn off with a ball Bellhorn has walked twice scored both of those times so 0 for 2 tonight but two runs scored swings through that one and we all know what Francisco Rodriguez did K Rod coming up out of nowhere in September in 2002 and then proceeded to win five of the 11 postseason games for the Angels in 2002. Most wins in one postseason by a pitcher. Only Randy Johnson's won five. I mean, if you win five games in a postseason, that's a career. How do you hit that mm. pitch, Tony? Woo. Starts out of the zone, looks like it's gonna come into the zone, but never does. That went past through the zone. 
And Bellhorn has struck out for the third time tonight. Well, their big boy struck, that being Vladimir Guerrero. It all of a sudden now with this strikeout to Bellhorn turns into Manny Ramirez time. This is why you come to the ballpark. Some of the fans chanting MVP. It's in a direct response to Guerrero's grand slam. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they took it personally. Tony, I think it's big right now that Boston scores here. You oh, got I your agree. closer already That's... in. If Anaheim wins tonight, Boston and their fans start thinking about, wow, we don't win tomorrow, it goes back to California. Popped by Erstad will give it a chase. That'll just land on the roof. Of course, you know everybody's thinking the same thing. And a four-run lead. Had a four-run lead, and, and, and they let it get away from them. Now they're closers in the game. Boy, Johnny Damon, I love what he did right there. Boomer. I saw it too, Sut. I was going to say the up. same thing. Erstad going hard. I mean, everybody's playing hard, but he stood up to try to help protect him if he were to fall into that dugout. I mean, that, that's just a good human being there. I mean, you compete, but look at Johnny Damon there. He wasn't trying to keep him from making a play. He was just trying to keep him from seriously getting hurt. Whoa. Ball's like passing through the strike zone. Kind of just grazing it, isn't it? The break on this breaking ball. It's a big breaking, breaking ball. And Manny Ramirez just standing there like really like he wasn't ready to, to pull the trigger. Took it for strike two. Pulled a chain on that one, and Ramirez has struck out. Two down in the eighth. Can you see why Mike Sosha wanted a battle of the bullpens? I mean, you take one of the best hitters in the game, and, and you just simply take the bat away from him is what K-Rod did. Look at it, Tony, way out in front. Very rarely do you see Manny that far out in front. He's usually... Pretty much right in the zone. And then that at bat way out in front. If I'm not mistaken, the bullpen for the Angels. Bullpen numbers only, eight strikeouts. You know how Brian Rungi gets down to look at the pitch and then he stands up to make that strike call? I think with K Rod on the mound, I just keep standing up. I mean, <laughs> It saved a lot of movement there. There he is. Oh, look at the way they're playing Ortiz. Now they have the second baseman, Amezaga, way deep like a the tenth fielder, the short fielder in softball. But then the shortstop is not over on that side of the bag. So basically there's a huge gap up the right center field alley for Ortiz. And that's where he goes, maybe. But well, this will be quite a throw. Almost by Amezica. Almost, Almost made like it. he needed to hit the cutoff man from the outfield. He made a nice Almost play. made it. I think you've got to go to the bench now if you're Terry Francona. An infield hit here by Ortiz up the middle. Look at him hustling down the line, Tony. And you guys have a way of smelling those base hits. Well, when you can see, yeah, when you got a chance to beat one out. And this is his second infield hit in the series. See him beat that ball out. So two doubles and then this single. Oh, he's hustling right now, but I, I might try to add some more speed down there on the base paths in case Trot Nixon were to hit a double. Something in the gap. You've got other people that might be able to score. Well, you're thinking Dave Roberts oh. specifically, aren't you? Oh, and with that high leg kick, I'm thinking stolen base. And we know he, he inserted Roberts. You know, in game two, and he did not get right. the jump, but he, he was, you know, it was a force play on a ball hit by Johnny Damon. The key was, though, even though Johnny Damon hit into the force play, Johnny Damon scored that. Yeah, he stole a base and stuff. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. If it's one out, does he make the move? I, I, I make the move. No outs, one out, two outs. I know that. I'll tell but you if what. it's one out, do you think he makes the move? I'm sure he would have there, but you, I, you've already got your closer in the game. I don't want to keep Ortiz's bat in the game. 
for later on Tony I, I agree with you but I think that's what he's thinking he wants to you see Ringy jump out in front of the plate there I guess K Rod must have said something but I think that's what he's thinking he's thinking you know this extra inning game I don't want to take one of my best bets out right now for an opportunity to score a run now if Nixon walks or gets himself in scoring position or gets Ortiz in scoring position it, it might change his, his thinking then from first base sometimes it's kind of hard to you know guarantee a ball in the gap he's going to be able to score or not so wait till you get him in scoring position well, Nixon with a huge at bat in the ninth inning of game two. Now has the count at two and one. Got one for three, singled in the third, and there's the, the Roberts, but far and away the fella, he and Damon, the, the guys who can move on this team. Roberts coming over from the Dodgers, where he had what, in the 30s, he's still in the stolen bases. Mankiewicz you saw, not Millar. Who's hitting? You know, the game's yeah, different now, yeah. right? Now well, look at the 13. Wait a minute. What did you know? I forgot for a second. Of course, they traded uniforms exactly. in the batting practice anyway. That big breaking mm. ball. Three and one to Nixon. Well, good call, but now. I mean, you can't send Ortiz in this situation, but if he had Roberts 3 1, Tony, I might let him go. Well, Nixon will walk. Ortiz to second. Let's see if doesn't he makes change move. your move. Let's see if he makes a move now. Don't you have to? I think you do now. Well, what's so. Sh I always say, you know, what's this Frank, conversation with the manager, not Bud Black, who usually goes in a non change situation? He's bringing all the infield in here. I mean, you've got a young infield, you've got Figgins there in the Mexico. All he's doing, Boomer, is saying, look, you guys play as deep as you possibly can. You have to try to knock it down to keep that ground ball from getting yeah. through. Now he will go to the pitcher and the catcher. Mike Sosha, there was no one ever better at calling a game and helping a pitcher get out of a difficult spot. He's looking back on that, plus, He's trying to work home plate umpire Brian Runge. There have been conversation from the dugout. They've looked back and forth. He's just trying to open up that strike zone for his pitcher. And the other thing he's, he's telling his infielders is, hey, you guys, shortstop, second, and first, you guys got to knock something down. If it goes, if it's a clean single to left field, Devannon's going to have a chance to make a play at the plate. Anywhere else, they, the infielders are going to have to try to knock the ball down. Remember the other night, Ben Cavins dropped a perfect bunt yes, down did. for a base hit. Figgins is giving him that again. Doug Mankavich. And will it be a lucky number 13 at the plate for Boston? Looks at ball one. He's really the only one, Tony, with any numbers against Rodriguez. Very impressive. Three for six. Mezzica flip to Eckstein and they make the play. Well, Mike Sosha backed them up to where they had time to make the play. He's done this before. Still tied. Frenchie. Smiling. Well, how quickly things can change in baseball. The Angels have done that with the slam by Vlad Guerrero, the five run seven. The Red Sox counting outs towards moving on. And now they just want to move forward. They're not even thinking about any other thing. They just don't want to play baseball tomorrow. It's not, oh, let's have a party and move on. 
The Angels have done all the right moves. How about the plays of Amezica, the one yep. that he didn't quite throw out Ortiz, both from the outfield grass. So he How made about a great that? point between innings. That's the same ball Figgins yeah. booted same earlier ball. in the game. It went for a hit, but it should have been an error. Yeah, the last ball that uh, Minkiewicz hit, that's the ball that Figgins booted, and Amezica makes a great play. And Gets him out of the inning. This is Eckstein to lead off the ninth inning for Anaheim in a tie game. It's 1 1. And it's another play. Amezica boots in the first inning right. of game, game one. one. We hadn't seen him since, really. Yep. Well, they needed to make plays today. They've made them. It took them two since, and a half games since, to make it. Since two and a half two innings and, a half and about oh, six innings. It's catch, they catch themselves in time. It's long mountain to climb yeah. yet. But Eckstein. Who single? That, how about that at bat that yep. he had last time up? One of the many clutch at bats to allow Guerrero the chance to hit the slam. Many Ramirez and left. One out. To the studio. They're chomping at their bit in Minnesota, aren't they, fellas? Yeah, Chris Torrey Hunter and the Twins getting ready for their pivotal third game with the Yanks coming up at the top of the hour. Minnesota one and nine all time in game threes. If this game goes past eight Eastern, Twins and Yanks start on ESPN two. All right, Dave, thank you. One out in the top of the Angels. Sean Figgins. 0 for three and a hit by pitch shows bunt charging Miller just in case. I think there's ever been a guy who needed a base hit is probably Sean Figgins. He's a hug. Just yeah, just something a to hug get and going. A base hit. Something positive. He's still taking good swings. He's just been a little bit late. He just needs to get on base yeah, here. Just I mean, get on base. The Angels were down to their last prayer. But with one swing of the bat, Mike Sosha's prayer was answered by Vladimir Guerrero. And if either Figgins or Erstad can get on base, it'll be Vladimir Guerrero again. And Troy Percival hoping to get in this series, and that would probably mean that the Angels have gone ahead. Not necessarily, but probably. Once again, that's why this at bat right here is huge. I doubt that Percival would come in in a tie game in right. this situation. Yeah, Maybe the 10th. Yep. I think he's just getting close to being ready in case, let's say Figgins makes an out and Erstad hits a homer and Vladimir makes an out on the first pitch. Mike Sosha has him up to getting close to where he could come in for that save. Well, look, look at it this way. We've played three full games. The ninth inning, the Angels have led for a half inning. This is a half inning. Right. Half inning. Just got a piece of it. You know, biting the end of that glove there. Isn't he? Three two pitch. Figgins drops one to left in front of Ramirez. So he's on with the go ahead run in the ninth for Anaheim. And that's a huge at bat right there because now you got you got a guy on base who could run who could steal you a base you got a guy at the plate who can handle the bat Figgins 3 2 pitch battles hard lines his ball to left field. You got a guy with 34 stolen bases down there he's going to have the green light he can go whenever he wants Erstad as good as there is Tony in this spot protecting that runner. And how about the at bat that he had 0 and 2 yeah. against Timlin. It's like two gunslingers staring each other down on that 3 2 pitch. You know it was seen forever. Neither stepped out or off the rubber yep. and then it was ball four and then Guerrero hit the slam. And you're not going to be able to, to read that in a box score. No. Tomorrow. You see he's 0 for 2. Yeah. And he was 0 and 2 when he coached that walk. He worked the camp to get that walk. Pretty close there. His walk did drive in a run. He made it yep. six two. And then the slam. What? He's leaning. Well, at some point he's gonna go. Mm -hmm. There's no question. The question for for Erstad's gonna be 
because he'll be he'll be checking trying to get a good view is whether to swing or let him steal it. Well, Derek Lowe up in the year and most of the year is the number three starter and that one misses to Erst. That what an eye he's got it two and zero. Oh. So now Lowe has been this team's closer, an all-star closer. No, he's up how and throwing, and, and I know that Vladimir Guerrero's two for nine off of Derek Lowe. Vladimir's two for two with a homer off Keith Folk, but I can't imagine you bring him in here. I don't think so. Look at Erstad. <laughs> Is there a better player this time of the year? He's great. He's set it for three games. You feel you feel the grind all the way up here when he's in the batter's box, don't you? <laughs> I think we're going to have action here. So on three and one, three and one, what we got go. You got the runner probably going. You got Ernst at the green light. If it's a if it's a strike, go ahead take a whack. If it's a ball, take it. And if it's a changeup, he should be able to steal it. Exactly. Just don't get just, picked off. Just don't get picked off. Too many options here. There he goes. Erstad drives it well to left center field. Ramirez got to play it off the wall. Figgins to third being held up there. Double by Darren Erstad. What a great deep by Manny Ramirez. The way he took off after that ball, you weren't sure if he was going to be able to catch it or if it was going to go off the wall. And Sean Figgins had to stop at second base to see. You know, Erstad drives his ball in the left center field. Now watch Manny Ramirez. He shifts over when he realizes he can't catch it, and Figgins was at second base waiting to see. He goes right now. There's a chance he scores. Exactly. If he's if he continues to go, he might have a chance to score. Well, Vladimir Guerrero's not going to drive anyone in here. He's going to be intentionally walked. And Garrett Anderson will come up with the bases loaded. The Red Sox, who led 6-1, stranded 10 runners in the first five innings. And now it's the Angels who have a bunch of guys on. They delivered, certainly, Vlad did with his slam in the seventh. Garrett Anderson, who didn't have a hit in either of the first two games, is two for four in this game. Now, last time that the bases loaded, bang. Mm. Into the pen. And with that helmet that <laughs> I don't know what that is on there. Yeah. Yeah. Big difference, Boys, huh? They woke yeah. up, didn't they? And right here's a guy that even though he's not at 100 percent, Garrett Anderson has had a lot of success against. Six for 11. Ooh. That's 545 with a homer against Keith Paul. Look at the wall. Just the same kind of spot that maybe Erstad hit it off. Although he comes inside. That's certainly not a wall pitch there. Strike one. Big pitch full. I'm really surprised he even started him out inside with a fastball. You know, I think even Garrett's up there knowing he's going to try to get him out of way. It's just a matter of if he can stay back and hit a ball to left field or not. That'll be foul. And now Folk advantage has two quick strikes on Garrett Anderson. Pretty gutsy from mm -hmm. Folk coming inside twice. Maybe that's Veritek. Rick, maybe Veritek says, hey, let's change it up on him. He knows we've been going away. And he's had success yeah. against him in the past. I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, let me let me just bust him in under his knuckle, see if, he's, if we can surprise him. Bust him up and in. It's one and two. Troy Gloss was homer in the on deck circle. He has gotten right on top of yeah. home plate now. He's trying to take that change up yeah. away as, from Falk. As Falk was coming set, he was creeping up in a batter's box. Gets him to wave at it. What a 
big job by Falk and Garrett Anderson. You figure would just be able to loft one. That's all they need with a fast man at third, but he couldn't get it done. Tony is a hitter. A lot of times you will feel the catcher move behind you. What Veritek did on that pitch, he moved inside to begin with. He set up inside, and then you can see right there at the end late, he moved away, I think setting up that big pitch and that strikeout. I agree, I, and I, th I also think Garrett Anderson was sitting on that changeup the whole time. Troy Gloss swings and misses at strike one. Well, he busted him in two times with the fastball, straightened him up going up and in, went away with the changeup, and as he was coming set, Anderson was creeping up in the batter's box looking for that changeup, and he still couldn't hit it. Gloss steps out. Figgins, Erstad, and Guerrero. They want to be on the move. Folk wants to sit Gloss down. Buzzes him inside. One and one. Veritek Cabrera Miller coming up for Boston, bottom nine. That's a good pitch right there. I'm not trying to hit anybody, just letting him know. Boy, got a pitch. would be the go-ahead run. Yeah, I got to, I got to get inside. I got to get you conscious of this ball inside. In there for a strike on the corner, one and two. Works Again. him in, works him out. Again, Veritek setting up late, faking like he was setting up in, going away. Lost feeling like that ball's not really a strike. He gets him. The agonizing weight. Gloss is struck out. Folk has stranded the bases full. And the Red Sox head to the bottom of the ninth with a chance to win this AL Division Series if they can just scratch one run across. Oh, we got some noise here at Friendly Fenway here on the bottom of the ninth. Jason Baratek, Orlando Cabrera, Billy Miller up against Francisco Rodriguez. The Angels had their opportunity to take a rare lead for them at any point in the series. And now the Red Sox try to win it in their last at bat and move on to the AL Championship Series. In 1912, when this building just, it was a baby. It was his first five, six months. And the Red Sox history, their only postseason walk-off series win the 1912 series in game eight of the World Series against the New York Giants. That's a long, long, long time ago. Four, three, and one. Huh? Said game eight. They said game eight. They won four. They lost three, and they tied one. I guess it got dark. Come on back tomorrow, boys. Watch what Veritek does here to help get the strikeout with Garrett Anderson. He's really been the key in this series. Look how he moves inside, Tony. I mean, a hitter can feel that. Erstad might have given location there, and what happened? He set that change up up. He got the strikeout from Garrett Anderson, the guy that had owned Keith Folk up to that moment. This is Veritek's moment. Veritek to Erstad, and Darren has it one out. Veritek, who's two-run home run in game two, Erased the only angel lead of the series. And now Veritek is gone, and he'll have those uh, the chest protector on in two pitches. Look at Erstad. Look at how quick he Mike Sosha says he's the best defensive first baseman in the game. I mean, there's some good ones out yeah. there. There's a guy in San Francisco, but Sosha has seen him day in, day out, and what a transition from being one of the best defensive outfielders in the game. Mm -hmm. A couple of gold gloves out in the outfield now. In the hunt to win one at first. Yeah, we laugh about uh, Kevin Millar and we call him Mattingly or Keith Hernandez or J.T. Snow, as you say. But Erstad could be. 
Orlando Cabrera swings at that one. How about the way this ball dances in the strike zone, fellas? I just love the focus of Francisco Rodriguez. I mean, he went from being out of the ball game and Percival in to win it to all of a sudden now right back into the heat of the battle. I mean, one mistake, you lose the ball game, you go home. He has not made that mistake yet. Figgins. First out, and he digs it up. Figgins is scared out yes. there defensively, Tony. That There's not an easier throw than that for a third baseman. And without Erstad, he throws it away, and it possibly could have been a runner in scoring position. I don't think there's any question. He's definitely thinking about every time a ball is being hit to him. And he gets this ball in plenty of time to set his feet and make a good throw, but this throw is short, and Erstad does what gold glove first basemen do. They pick up their teammates out there, and he did a great job picking that ball out of the dirt. Sosha might be right. First that's, I mean, he's making catch and fly balls down the line. Billy Miller, two for four, scored twice. It happened right off the bat for Figgins. Top of the first, two outs, nobody on, and Manny Ramirez hit that top spin to him, and he just hasn't been the same defensively since. Way outside, one of one. I marvel, Boomer, at these relievers this time of the year. All of the appearances that they've had, all of the pressure pack situation. This guy only pitches with the lead or the game tied late in the game, and, and yet still throwing well. Chop, but that'll be wide of first. So K Rod ahead of Miller, one and two. How much longer do you think he? Manager Terry Francona is going to go with Fulk. If he doesn't score, he's going to go with Derek Lowe here. I don't know. To leave Fulk in the game. See him everybody else go. Well, that doesn't mean anything, but we've mentioned it the whole game. Three closers have gone three innings in this division series round. I mean, we, we looked uh, we looked up to the 1975 series that the Red Sox swept Oakland their only sweep I might add uh, in the history of Boston at the series sweep and I just going through the boxes Raleigh fingers came out on one of those games in the fifth and pitched the rest of the game yeah. for Oakland <laughs> fifth I know. well I don't think you have Derek Lowe up right now if you're not going to bring him in I mean if they score a run you go yeah, home. Yeah. he's up and throwing he's ready to go you, you have to figure that he will pitch in the top of the tenth if we get there. the count to two and two two out none on bottom of the ninth Red Sox led it six one stranding ten other runners in the first five innings Vladimir Guerrero's grand slam in the seventh tied it at six glad you could join us here at Fenway we the angels have scrapped and clawed the Red Sox have been so impressive at the bats Chris Berman Rick Sutcliffe Tony Gwynn Kyle Peterson a thrill to bring it to you. Miller to left. Jeff Devannon is there. And let's play some more, shall we? Going to extra innings at the fence. All right, Dave, because we are not done here. The Angels have come from way back to tie the Red Sox. And now we go to extra innings. If the Angels are going to exit this playoffs, it's not going to be very easily. And now, as uh, Sut, you suspected, Derek Lowe who was on the hill two years ago to clinch this very round against Oakland, getting with the bases loaded. Terrence Long, game five in Oakland. Now Lowe, much of the year, the number three starter, has come on to pitch relief. Kind of funny he wasn't good enough to start this game but he's good enough to come on and pitch an extra innings and you had to go somewhere if you're Terry Francona the reason is Keith Falk left everything he had in his body on the mound getting out of that jam in the top of the ninth inning Derek Lowe has had experience in the postseason we saw him in the postseason in this role last year against the Oakland A's started and relieved last year. He starts off against Jeff Devano, who hits it well to center field. Damon back to the track, and he hauls it in. Well, that ball kept going and going and going, and Damon had a good beat on it right off the bat. 
got a great jump. Cuba Vanna got a pitch hanging in the strike zone. And Damon goes back, has a great jump on it, and makes the play. I was going to say, this was the part of the lineup that Soch really had to work to give his the middle part of his lineup a chance to, to get him back in the ball game a few innings ago. And so, and again, you got Molina here. and a, Well, you know you have Molina here. It's just which one? Yeah, this, this is Jose, Jose Molina. Molina. And then a Mezica after him. And so, very tough on the Angels here. Offensively, Somebody's going to have to try to swing the bats and get something go to get something going. Well, Derek Lowe is, is a guy that depends on his defense. And he was leading all of baseball in unearned runs allowed until they were able to acquire Cabrera, the shortstop. When he's at his best, he's a he's a sinking fastball type guy. Gets a lot of ground balls. I think Johnny Damon is vastly underrated defensively himself. That was a nice play he made. Especially in this ballpark. With the, all that room on the right side of this field here. That was a heck of a play. Yeah, it was. The ball was about to rattle off the garage door out there in, in center field. Mm -hmm. Who knows which way it would have yeah, bounced. Nobody it knows. The hit out there. Earlier the shadows, then the garage door. It's always a mystery. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks? The, sh the garage door do. Before. Yeah. Now, how about Derek Law having to change his mindset? You know, all of a sudden you're not one of the starters. We'll see how we use you. And we'll see what you'll be ready. And then, I mean, he's been a closer That's before. Ball four, buddy. Yeah, I was gonna say, I thought that yeah. was ball four. He, Does he want to hit that bat? Yeah, I guess he was so locked in. He was. Well, the Angels, the Red Sox have found out what everyone else in the American League has found out. And no quitting them, right, Mike Sosha? Well, they won't know. They're going to go out there and play their game. Uh, for for a team to to uh, for us not to win a series, a team is going to have to go out there and beat us. And that's a good feeling when you're when you're managing a club because uh, uh, they're not going to give the other club anything. Uh, they're not going to quit when they get behind. They're not going to quit when they get ahead. Uh, these guys are going to play the game hard all the way out. So the other team's got to step up and beat you, and that uh, you know that, that makes us feel good. Mike Sosha's Angels have knotted this thing at six. And low thrown over to take a look at Jose Molina. I mean, I, I can't believe he's well, that's there it is. The bunt laid down and a tough throw, nicely done by Bill Miller. So Amezaga bunts it. Molina to second, and it wasn't that that was a nice play there. That was a great play by Billy Miller. Amezaga put it down exactly where you needed to put it down and Miller came a long way for this ball and bare hands and throws right on the money. Well, here's a big picture now, right? Here's a team that couldn't field or bunt for two and a half games. But all of a sudden, exactly, Boomer, we're starting to see productive outs from Anaheim. Mm -hmm. They led the American League in that category this year. Mike Sosha didn't expect the Mezica to drive in a run or even get a hit, but he has seen David Eckstein get a lot of hits. A hit right now could mean the lead. Eckstein chops it. Cabrera didn't get him. Miller made a first move for the ball. Of course, the runner, Molina, was in the eyesight as well, though Cabrera's made that play a lot. Just Eckstein with his little wheels just beat it out. Yep. And it's, you know, this in and. See, uh, well, maybe. Cabrera does all he could do. Plants his foot and makes a good throw. But this is Angel Baseball right here. Guys putting the bat on the ball. Next time getting down the line, beating it out. It's like, it's like a little fiat running up the line, you know. It's like he said in that little sound bite we had before game two. Is, I'm just a little pest. I just, you know, I, I just try to get a little hit when they don't want me to, and try to make a play when they don't expect me to. You talked about Figgins needing a base hit in his last at bat, Tony. He got it. He should have more confidence than at any point in this series. Molina, the catcher, lead and showed bunt in Figgins. Molina leads off third, Eckstein off first. So strike one for Derek Lowe. Oh, and Mike Sosha is just irate right now with that first pitch being called a strike. He thought it was low. And from the dugouts, I mean, you got Derek Lowe on the mound, but. From the dugouts, you can't tell if the ball's on a corner or not, but you can see if the ball was up or down. 
Sosha Close. thought that ball was low, but as you see it crossing K right. zone, it was the correct call. Up the middle, Cabrera over to first and gets the speedy figures. So the Angels strand two. Low does the job. Boston has a chance to win it in the bottom of the tenth. Bottom of the tenth here at Fenway. And Orlando Cabrera knowing that Figgins had wheels. How big was he on this slow chopper, fellas? Oh, just huge. I mean, not too many shortstops are going to make this play. And you see Eckstein was already at second base. He had to go to first base. And with the way Figgins can run, he knew he had to get rid of it in a hurry, and he made it look easy. Johnny Damon, who batted four times in the first five innings and got aboard three of those, now leads off the tenth against Francisco Rodriguez pitching his third inning. You just have the feel that Damon will somehow find a way to get on. Well, Bloomer, and you talked earlier about closers throwing three innings. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it worked with Smoltz, sometimes it has not. Ooh. We haven't seen too many swings like that no. from Damon, have we? No, we haven't. We've seen a lot of them, though, since K-Rod came yeah, into we this have. game. <laughs> we saw Manny Ramirez go after a breaking ball a lot like that. I mean, that's just, that does not happen to Johnny Damon very often. I don't think there's many guys that can throw a breaking ball that breaks that much either like Rodriguez can. Damon up the middle, base hit. You just know it. On board for the fourth time tonight, the tenth time this series. It, it, the guys, he's one of the best leadoff men that we've seen in a while. This is breaking ball, backdoor breaking ball, stays on it, hits it back where it came from. That breaking ball didn't have as much break as the one before that, but he was right on it. Now Mark Bellhorn up the guys with the migraines now are the Angels thanks to Damon Suck. Got a bunt here. Pulls it back for ball one. I think you got to turn around and think sacrifice one more time. But Tony if the count goes two and oh manage for us a little bit. Try to steal. Well that for back. me I'm I'm button I'm button here. I'm, way. I'm sacrificing the at bat to get this guy in scoring position. I know they're going to walk Manny Ramirez and I'm going to you know, I'm going to take my shot with Ortiz up there. Uh -oh. One. Figgins. Can he make this throw? Man he made it difficult but um, a big time play. Eckstein was unbelievable on this ball. This could have been another error for Figgins. He made the right move. He went in the right direction. He was in to begin with. The butt was right to him. Yep. But watch the throw and watch the play by Eckstein. Look at the stretch. Wow. Look at him come up with it. Stay on the back. It does not get any better than that. That's exactly. I couldn't you describe it any better. You knew it as soon as he was throwing it. You knew it would be dicey. Yep. I said, uh oh, as soon as the ball went down, Figgins charged it fine, was in position. Made a poor throw, but Eckstein saved him with a great scoop. Stretching to stay on the bag. He is out. And now the pinch runner for Bellhorn at first oh. as Manny Ramirez. It's Pokey Reese out oh, there. That's right. But he'll go to second. Get of Roberts, right? exactly. Right. Pokey Reese, the pinch runner, who, if Boston doesn't win it here, will obviously stay to play in the field for Bellhorn. And he struck out against K Ride of the eighth. Two for four with two ribbons. In there for a strike. Good pitch. One and one. Here's that 7 6 game we were talking yeah. about the other night, huh? Came from nowhere. Yeah, just, I mean, even tonight's game, you wouldn't have expected it, especially the way things were going early. I don't know, 
But still, you know, it's, even though it's a tie game, you get Pokey Reese at first who can run a little bit. That big leg kick by Rodriguez, I still wouldn't be afraid to maybe try to steal a bag here. Always that chance for a wild pitch, too. One and two. I agree with you, though. If I'm Terry Francona, I, I, I've got a. I've got to push the issue a little to. bit right now. Your closer's gone. Most of your bullpen is gone. You got one of your starters out there already. I mean, I, I take a chance they throw it away, and, and, and you know, you're still going to have the at bat from Manny Ramirez here. I agree with you. I, I, I'm going to push the envelope. I got a two nothing lead in the series. You know, at the very least, I'm going to be back here tomorrow, so I, I'm going to push it a little bit. Manny knew it. Completely fooled him and was headed to the dugout as soon as the ball hit Molina's mitt. Looking for a breaking ball. Rodriguez pumped in a fastball. Now Sochi's got a decision to make. Yeah, what do I am? I gonna let Rodriguez pitch to Ortiz. I got looks like Washburn standing there in the bullpen. I I yeah, but he he's now we, he says John Lackey for tomorrow if there is one. I know there's no tomorrow unless you win, but I'm not so sure Washburn doesn't start tomorrow if we get there. But we'll know in about 20 seconds. He's going to discuss this one. Yep. And everybody in will huddle up on the mound. This is where you look into the eyes of that reliever to try to see what's in his heart and soul as far as the truth is. What do you got left? I mean, this is. You have to admire yeah. Rodriguez, Tony. And, and and for Soch, this is an easier job than it is for a lot of other managers because he's been behind the plate. He can he knows when a pitcher's starting yep. to lose a little bit. Good and call he's making a move. Will it be Washburn? You would think. So much for that theory. Frankie out. Bottom of the tenth. Frankie Rodriguez has gone about as far as he can go and Mike Sosha went out as Rick Sutcliffe you described it look in his eye took a minute and now he's back with the starter in game number one and the reason Jared Washburn can do that is he was gone in that fourth inning Remember, Millar hit the big homer off him Washburn certainly no stranger to postseason heroics or tough spots. A really a difficult decision to make because in game one Ortiz had a base hit and an RBI in the first inning he walked in his second at bat he has had a lot of success against Washburn but you have to understand Rodriguez gave him everything he possibly had as has just about everybody mm -hmm. out there on the field today well he went two and two thirds did K Rod and here's David Ortiz you see that number today with three hits this could be four back it goes it's over the Red Sox win and they're moving on up. Boston lineup. Mike Sosha made all the right moves until the last one. David Ortiz was ready for Washburn. 
And the Red Sox win it 8-6. But boy, it comes down to a move that Terry Francona did not make. We talked about it in the bottom of the eighth. He had Ortiz at first base. He had two outs. He could have pinch run for Ortiz with Dave Roberts. Try to steal a base, maybe steal a ball game. He did not make that move. He kept Ortiz's bat in the ball game, and it's a difference in the series. So for the second year in a row, the wild card Red Sox bounced the AL West champs because David Ortiz saw one pitch and he unloaded. And the October 8th, 2004 Boston D party as in division series is underway. They've just got a lot of answers at the plate, huh, guys? They do. And Rick Sutcliffe, Tony Gwynn enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. As always, Boomer. Will this year be different for Boston? You cannot go on and think World Series unless you start winning series. Only their second sweep in franchise history in the postseason. They made it then in 75 when they swept Oakland. The final, an Ortiz's homer in 10. Red Sox 8, the Angels 6. For all of us at Fenway, thanks for watching. John Miller, Joe Morgan in Minneapolis.